Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. I have got a very special guest uh, on today, someone that I'm sure you all already know, an absolute expert in the world of Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire. I'll let him introduce himself. Aziz, do you want to say hi? Hi there, everybody. Hey, thanks for having me, Robert. It's fun to be back. We've had some great discussions on here and this has been a pretty active week in the fandom, an active year, really. I mean, honestly, I'm still... The, with the hype from the trailer is pretty huge, but I was still, you know, on cloud nine from fire and blood. You know, I'm, I haven't, I haven't come down from that yet. So this is like, I was already high from that. Now I'm even higher. It's yeah. We're just, we're coasting on so much new material when we're uh, after quite a wait, right? We had a long wait between season seven and eight and we didn't have, you know, obviously didn't expect any new book material. So we got book material. We got season eight. That's just, yeah, it's great. It's a great time to be in this fandom. It's amazing, and, and it's so much has been going on just these last few days, so many fantastic videos and thoughts and, and conversations. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to, uh, well, the original plan for today was to talk about uh, the video that I did. I did the premiere on it uh, a few days ago, two or three days ago, which was looking at R plus L equals J, the question of who are Jon Snow's parents. Um, and I came out with the, what I think is a largely uncontroversial view that it is Rhaegar and Lyanna. I know there are other views out there, but I just wanted to tease out for myself what I thought were the main arguments in favour of it. So we're still going to be talking about that, uh, but obviously the trailer, season eight trailer, dropped. Um, and so we're going to have a quick uh, chat about that. It might not be quick. We'll see how many questions we get. Uh, but we'll <laughs> talk about that first. Um, and then uh, then we'll move on to R plus L equals J. Uh, so, guys, uh, just a quick thank you for some super chats before we even went live. Uh, Maura Lee, thank you so much. A couple of fantastically generous uh, super chats. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, saying, been enjoying all of the wonderful content on both of your channels in Deep Geek and The Well Told Tale. Thank you so much for all the hard work and passion you put into everything you do. You're very welcome. And also for History of Westeros and all the research that goes into all of your videos. I second that. Um, if you do want to go and check out uh, History of Westeros, and I would highly recommend it, there's a link down in the description. There's some fantastic videos and a whole lot of background stuff there. Um, well, one personal recommendation, I think, that uh, you did a, a series on Blackfire Rebellions. And if you're ever interested in what's going on there, just... Um, picking it because it's something we just sort of glibly talk about, then I would highly recommend you go off and uh, check that out. Thanks. Jack, uh, no, an absolute pleasure. Uh, Jack Hurst uh, uh, saying, just want to show some support because season eight is almost here. Loved the first video with Gemma and just wanted to know when we can expect the rest of that series. That was a series, uh, and thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's a series I'm doing with Gemma of, of six videos. We're going to alternate, so half of them on her channel, half of them on mine. Uh, we're going through some of the, uh, the lesser houses, but the more intriguing ones, the ones that we think have clearly got some kind of secrets or something hidden away. Um, so we started with House Mormont over on Gemma's channel. The second one is House Hightower. We've recorded that. I just need to edit it and get it up. It will be up in the, some point in the next few days. Then we've got four more coming up, uh, and we're going to be recording them soon. House Reed and House Dane, I think, are our next two. So, yes, it's Very still cool. happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. I'm really looking forward to it. We've got some just, just the ones that we think that they punch above their weight, uh, that there's clearly something going on. So we're just trying to explore what's going on there. Uh, and LML, uh, thank you so much for your super chat. Uh, gonna miss Let me guess, it was minutes. 666. It was indeed 666. Okay. The, the man is a legend. <laughs> uh, getting a birthday haircut. You guys both rock. Um, Robert, uh, he says Greta video, man. I think he means great video, man. Mm. But thank you. I, I appreciate yeah, he, that. He um, does that text-to-speech, uh, voice-to-text uh, thing with his phone. It, cre it creates the funniest uh, autocorrects, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And finally, Mod Mary one saying, happy name day, LML. Well, yeah, happy birthday. I think it's a belated birthday. I think, I think, think this actually is your birthday, but happy birthday, LML. Uh, and thank you so much for that. Um, so let's get into this. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, a few questions from my patrons. As always, we'll go with... Uh, I'm framing this around the questions I get from my patrons. I always give priority to their questions. Obviously, if we get any super chats, we'll come to them as soon as we can. 
and we'll try and pick up as many comments and questions in the chat as we go. Uh, but let's start with the trailer. We've got quite a few different questions on, on that. Uh, Wonder Dog 26 Art Girl was talking about the scene in uh, the crypts when we get Varys in the crypts. And so, um, Aziz, I'll throw this one over to you just to start with. Uh, why was Varys there to start with? Uh, secondly, there was a statue with its sword raised in the background. Detail I, I kind of picked up on, but not really thought about huge amounts. Uh, do you think that that means that the Kings of Winter were awaking? So what do you think? What was going on there? Okay, a couple things. Um, as uh, it's funny to me, not in a bad way. I'm not. I'm not even a little bit upset about this. But it is amusing to me that the crypts of Winterfell have been a thing, a, a, a fertile ground for theorizing since the first book. So since 1996, John's dreamt of the Stone Kings waking from their graves. This, this, the theory that the that something would happen in the crypts, either the Stone Kings rising or the others like finding a way through or both has existed since 1996. So it's kind of funny to me that we got confirmation of it on a trailer. <laughs> Out of, for all that time, a TV trailer is what gave us the confirmation. Now, I guess it's not 100% confirmed and maybe something will different happen in the books, but it's a pretty safe uh, assumption that uh, this is this foreshadowing that's been widely predicted is, is coming to pass. Now, to answer more directly, I think they're hiding down there because as so much of the rest of the trailer shows, there's a big, big battle happening at Winterfell and the people who are non-combatants are hiding in the crypts as a ma as a way to take shelter. And of course it gives vibes uh, of Helm's Deep from Lord of the Rings, which in yeah. fact, the director, Miguel Sapochnik, specifically said he watched that scene in particular, Helm's Deep, and studied it uh, in, 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 along with studying a lot of other action scenes uh, in terms of how he wanted to do this battle. But also in that scene, you know, Gilly is in the corner with uh, little Sam. Yeah. In that same shot with Varys. So uh, to me, I'm worried about them. I think that Varys is one of the most likely characters to die. Uh, his role has been greatly diminished uh, the last few seasons. And Melisandre flat out says, you're going to die. <laughs> in the last season so a lot of things pointing to it um i'm i'm also worried about gilly but i think she's a little more likely to survive and killing baby sam would be really t rough thing to do so i'm not sure uh but i think that th it's a it's kind of an irony that they're hiding in the crypts which will probably become a very dangerous place to be uh possibly more dangerous than a lot of the safer well, more dangerous places so yeah yeah, I mean, I think on Varys, I find it hard to disagree. The, if you look at who the the lords of the ruling houses were at the beginning of season one, they've all gone. If you look at who was on the small council at the beginning of season one, they've all gone except for Varys. So Varys is the last member of this kind of the old order of things. And really, if we are going to have a complete shakeup of, of, of how the world is governed, then Varys has to go too. So I think, yes, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with everything that Melisandre uh, predicts and says yeah. is going to come true. Uh, she's got quite a sketchy uh, track record on that one, let's say. Uh, Agreed. But I think that there is a fair chance that he will uh, die and he's not really a, a fighting type let's uh let's put it that way i think it's probably I, I should have started this by by asking what your overall thought is on the the trailer i'll, I'll give okay. i'll give mine because i think that the my top thought is that this is taken they i think they've learned the lessons from what was an excellent Westworld season two trailer, and they've just shown the first half of this season. I think they've they've not shown any of the stuff that happens in episodes four through to six. I think this is almost entirely episodes one to three, and uh, leaving aside the the Cersei stuff, perhaps we'll come and talk about that in just one moment. Uh, but it it appears very clear that the action seems to be roughly what we thought it was going to be. There's no huge shocks or surprises here. So the kinds of things we're talking about 
tend to be the details or have we seen anything mm-hmm. in the details so actually what we thought was going to happen was that John and Danny and and the dragons and the Dothraki and the Unsullied were all going to head up north and so's Jamie and they're all going to meet up there and then uh, a whole load of awkward encounters with each other then getting themselves ready and then suddenly there's going to be a big fight for Winterfell and that seems to be what's happening so so my headline is that actually there's nothing big new here it's just a matter of digging and sifting through the details but what was your sort of overall thought on it i largely agree with your take there i have a few different things to say but uh, nothing i would i don't think there's anything i would disagree with the trailer as a whole i thought was really excellent as far as trailers go it was it was well done um i agree with you that it's highly unlikely to have shown anything past episode three um we on our show <clears throat> excuse me we did a the freeze frame and looked at every single frame of the trailer and i i can't see anything that appears to be beyond episode three and uh there's nothing of the northern characters interacting with the southern characters and like you said it's just a bunch of different ways of people interacting with this large battle or getting ready for it the one thing missing from it i suppose is the dragons we see dragons in the trailer but we don't see them in the battle we don't see night king's dragon we see that hoof come down but that's probably not night king because he has a dragon now i don't know why he'd be on a horse so that's probably one of the secondary white walkers i don't they don't really have a name for those guys but this the tier two the non-night king the knights the pale knights council <laughs> yeah the knight small council yeah whatever we call it so um So it was a fun trailer for sure. It it did the thing that trailers are supposed to do. It got people excited and it didn't give too much away, which I think is a a flaw with a lot of trailers these days is they give away too much. And in fact, a lot of people have avoided this trailer. Maybe not a lot, but a notable number of people have avoided this trailer because that's what they want to avoid. Now, there's no way I I could tell them, hey, this trailer doesn't actually give away that much. But you never know. Somebody might see something and... It tells them something that they don't want to know. You never know what somebody's spoiler policy is. So, you know, I I always just respect whatever people want to do there. Yeah, I thought it was a really strong trailer, really fun. It did the job it was supposed to do. And I should probably say, uh, if you're watching this later on and and you don't want to hear any of this trailer stuff, I should have said this at the beginning, obviously. Um, <laughs> I will I'll put a timestamp in the first comment, uh, um, uh, a pinned comment for when we just go on and start talking about R plus L equals J rather than the trailer. So, uh, so if you want to speed forward to that without listening to this, uh, then uh, you can go and do that. Um, Klaus oh. Richter, thank oh, you so cool. much. Uh, for the uh, super chat, uh, 20 euros, that's very generous, uh, saying, I found your video R plus L equals J very informative. You have made many points that support this theory very clearly. Uh, Dave and Mary Ellen uh, offered to discuss this theory in a friendly way. Will you accept this offer? Um, so Dave and Mary Ellen, for those who don't know, are Order of the Green Hand. What I've I've said from the beginning, this is not... a uh, me versus them or anyone against them. I, I, I see everything we do here in this community as building a kind of a collaborative effort to try and understand what's going on. I've had the guys on this channel before. I've been on their channel before. I would count them as friends within the community. Of course, I'm happy to talk to them about anything, but uh, what I don't want is anything kind of built up to be like a, a, a one side versus another side uh, thing. So uh, I'll, I'll talk to them about that. And uh, if we think we can do something in a constructive way, then then we will. But uh, thank you so much, Klaus, for the for that. That's uh, fantastic. Let's uh, let's come back to the trailer. Um, the the other part of um, the the question from uh, Twenty Six Art Girl was about the statue with its raised sword and whether this means that the kings of winter were going to rise. This is something that I uh, reasonably strongly believe is going to happen in the books in some ways that the the, the dead under Winterfell will rise. Um, I my gut instinct is it won't happen on the show but what what do you think Aziz do you think that there is going to be something magical down there or is the the thing in the crypts that is important simply John discovering more about his parentage in some way well I do think there's going to be yeah I definitely think there's going to be the parentage part that's that that's we're not skipping past that somehow so and of course the trailer seems to hint there's a couple of scenes of John brooding like he's never brooded before and he's a master brooder so that's uh 
<laughs> so that's really saying something. And um, I think that, yeah, I do think that it, it hasn't really been foreshadowed in the show for something like this to happen, but it doesn't need to. I think I think the audience would just get it. They're like, oh, yeah, those are crypts. So undead things coming out of tombs makes sense. Like you don't need to explain that or set it up too much. I think people will just get it because it's kind of mm. it's sort of standard horror movie stuff in a sense. Um not not to demean it. I think it's really cool, the idea of it, um, be especially because it's it ties the Starks to the dead in a way, um, which might get at some of this deeper origin story stuff, the Starks connected to Night King and all that. Um, so, yeah, and I think it's also it's just going to be a great way to show a battle. Like you have this battle raging outside where they're fighting for their lives and it's, 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 it's a, a close run thing. And meanwhile, it's happening on the inside too. They're the people who are supposed to be the safest are being attacked as well. And with Arya having the the wonderful part of this, one of the great parts of this trailer is this great juxtaposition from the beginning where Arya is talking to, I guess, Gendry. It does we don't know who she's talking to, but it seems like Gendry because she's holding that obsidian spearhead uh, at the end when we see her talking. And that looks like the forges. And then she's fighting with that same weapon in that trailer later. So uh, she goes from being kind of almost cocky to being terrified. And you wonder what that could be. It's almost like something unexpected happened because she's not, she know she's sitting here saying, I'm eager to meet this version of death. So what would, if she's, not afraid of it then what would terrify her so much and why would she need to mm. psych herself up right like she's standing there like psyching herself up and then she kind of makes a run for it um and then at another point she seems to be fighting outdoors and that's when the spear is whole and then she's indoors and the spear is broken so it seems like she starts the battle on the outside and then goes in and then it's hard to figure what she's running from so I love it. I don't know what um I don't know what the statue plays into it directly. I don't know if it matters which king that is, but yeah, I think the statues are going to come alive. Maybe not not the statues come alive, but I think that either the others will find a way a back way through and enter the crypts through some collapsed tunnel thing that's been mentioned in the books or they come right out of their tombs. Um but yes, action in the crypts. I I yeah. predict for sure. I think I think that's true, and I think uh, Rex on Patreon. I think that answers your question about what's going to go down in the in the crypts of Winterfell. I agree completely. I think that um, the way that this is going to start is what looks like some kind of normal siege in a way. Um, th then th they'll get pushed back and pushed back, and I think that the 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 references across to the Battle of Helm's Deep are very clear. Is that this is you finally getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back until something happens that will allow uh, some core of people at least to survive. So that I think means that yes, we're going to see battle on the field. We're going to see battles on the battlements and in and around Winterfell and indeed underneath Winterfell in the crypts. I think that. That's almost certain. Uh, I don't think there's going to be Sleeping Dragon underneath there. Um, I think that we will see at least one direwolf uh, being a uh, ghost. Um, I hope, I would love there to be Nymeria and her super pack, but um, uh, perhaps the budget won't run that far. Who knows? Um, but while we're talking about the Night King, um, let's go. Linda Prasuta is asking about the eyes, the Night King's eyes. Now, they, if they're, as I said, we're talking lots about details here, and it seems that if you go close in on his eyes, and this was, I think, on the Entertainment Weekly picture, the pupils are shaped like a seven-pointed star. Now, that is obviously loaded in the world of ice and fire because we've got the faith of the seven and all the rest of it. Does this mean... Uh, that oh, well, well, what does it mean? I think is the the open question I'm going to put to you, Aziz. Do you think that this is signifying something where perhaps they or the Night King is part of this uh, uh, the, the 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 seven hearts of God or the seven incarnations of God in the faith of the seven? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think it's um, I, I but I don't have a good answer to what it is. I, I don't see how it could tie into the lore the seven are 
chronologically don't match up with the Night King's timeline at all. And, and even if we give the show some leeway, because the show is a little looser with chronology um, than the books are, but this would be really loose. This is, you know, thousands of years loose. So I kind of, I kind of doubt that, but, um, you know, but on the other hand, uh, it's just so striking. I, and, and, you know, despite the fact that I can't, I can't find a way to connect it via what details we have, it doesn't mean it's not their intent, but, but, but the caveat to that caveat is there hasn't been a single detail in the show relating to this, nor has it been mentioned. It's just the magazine cover. So maybe they're going to raise this issue during this season and explain why it looks that way. But it's almost too subtle to matter, you know, <laughs> because it's just it hasn't been discussed. It's just so yeah. small. I mean, uh, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about it, because I, I'm, it's got me a bit baffled. I, I don't have a great answer. Well, my default answer is that they just thought it looked cool. Um, <laughs> That's kind that of where I'm at. I, 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 my, I, I sometimes think we in the community, we pour over every single detail and then we try and read so much into every single detail that I think the primary aim here is to make this season, amongst the showrunners as a whole, is to make this season look cool. And I think that his eyes look cooler like that um yeah i don't think this means that he is the stranger or something like that i don't think that that's what's going on there i don't think there's a link across to uh Aya and the faceless men and and and, and many face god and all the rest of it i don't think that's what's going on here um they may be just trying to do a little nod to something along the way but i don't think this is going to be a critical plot point that we're just uh, only just finding out about here. Um, uh, just in terms of Aya, quite a few people in the chat I noticed were suggesting that Aya was trying to draw people in in the way that she's sort of done with the waif, for example, that she's there and she she waits and then she like is the bait and draw, draws white walkers into a trap or something. I like the sound of that. That seems to work for me. That sounds like the kind of thing that she might volunteer to do. So uh, yeah, I think that's entirely possible. I agree. That's a good theory. I um, hadn't thought of that one. Um, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Like it's because she's definitely, that would explain why she's waiting. She's pausing and then she takes off. It's like, it's definitely like she's waiting for something. And then she definitely looks behind herself. She sees, she's looking to see, and that can kind of give the impression that she's worried that someone's chasing her, but it might be checking to make sure they're chasing her. So yeah, that's a good idea. I like that a lot. Yeah. And there was a few people in the chat. So thank you for that one. Um, We've got one other thing. I've noticed we've got a couple of super chats I'm going to come to in just one moment. But as we're on the subject of the Night King, there's uh, something I hadn't picked up on before, but Susan Dunkel over on Patreon um, has a quote from the Entertainment Weekly article. Right. With um, It's an interview with the guy who plays uh, the, the Night King. I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Vladimir uh, Furtick, I think. Oh, excellent news. Uh, I, I, you always <laughs> have the knowledge of these, always. Um, uh, he says, people will see that he, the Night King, has a target he wants to kill, and he will find out who that is. There's also that moment in Hard Home when Jon Snow was on the boat and the Night King looked at him and raised his arms. There's a similar and even stronger moment between Jon and the Night King this time. So... The question is, well, first of all, who is the target, do you think? The Night King wants to kill someone. Who who do you think that might be? Um, I do think it's Bran because we've already seen that attempt. The, the only character we've seen him try to like specifically target, seemingly, is Bran. Um, I, it, and he's, as we may have, I think we mentioned before, there's almost no attempt to kill John. He's had John right in front of him multiple times and doesn't seem to target him. So if it's John, I'd be disappointed because we've already seen him have this chance. Uh, and then, and especially because of the way you quoted, uh, the way that quote is worded, where he says, he's also going to have this moment with John where he raises his arms, which kind of hints that he's no not, yeah. <laughs> that it's not John. So, so I think my best guess is it's Bran, and I would say that it's not John. As far as other people, it could be. It's hard to say. Like I don't know why it could be Danny. 
uh, he barely had a shot at Danny with those ice lances, I guess, but he didn't take the first shot at her. So I feel like if it's somebody he wants that badly he and they were in his field of vision, he would have gone for them right away. So I don't yeah. think it's Danny either, but Danny is a solid guess. I, I, I wouldn't, I don't hate that guess. Uh, but I just can't see who else it would be. I mean, I see, I saw someone in the chat say Howland Reed, which would be kind of cool, but <laughs> he's just been in the show so little. I just like, why would that, that just would be kind of unsatisfying for a TV audience to have the Night King go after a character that's barely been seen at all. And most people don't even know his name. So I, and, and especially because Mira seems to have been written out of season, th you know, of season eight. So I, I, I feel, I feel like the lack of options puts it at brand. It's the same thing that we face with the books when we say, who are going to ride the dragons? Well, if you narrow it down, there's just so very few choices. You, you can't, there isn't a long list, right? So you got Tyrion, you got Bran, you got Jon, you got maybe Euron, maybe Fagon, that's it. I mean, <laughs> you can't yeah. really, uh, and in this case, I think we have an even shorter list. So I don't know. I, I struggle thinking of anybody but Bran here. I can't, I can't, can't get anywhere else on that. What do you think? No, I agree. I think that if it's a single target, then Bran is the most obvious. The The language here could be slightly broader and in terms of uh, the other group of people that the White Walkers seem to be wanting to be killing other children of the forest. And so uh, I don't know if they're going to go that way, but if they do, uh, if there are more children of the forest, if there is... Um, some sort of central heart to the Weirwood network, then that could be a target they want to kill. Um, but in terms of the characters, I think season eight is very much going to be, they're not going to be introducing new stuff for them to knock down. They're not going to set up much new stuff to knock down. There's going to be a few reveals, but in, if we're talking about characters who are going to be targeted, then yeah, Bran is by far, I think, the most obvious one there. Um, and a couple of super chats. Uh, Donna Daly, uh, thank you so much, uh, saying Jamie says something in the long lines of I fight for the living. Made me think of Benjamin's uh, I still fight for the living. Could their fate be similar? Yeah, I think I think hmm. it could. I think it could I, in, in as much as I think there's a fair chance that Jamie will do something heroic. Um, I do like the idea of, um, it's not my original idea, lots of people have said it, the idea that eventually Brienne might write the last bits of his, his entry in the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the great book that they have down there. What's it called? The White Book, is it? Yeah, the White yeah, Book. Yeah, the White Book um, with, with uh, um, the, the King's Guard, Annals of Glory, effectively, because um, at the moment it says that he's a Kingslayer and it's uh, Brienne is the person who he has unloaded himself to and told the full truth to. So it's right for her mm. to, to do that. So I like that as an ending, which means that I, he has a suitably heroic one, um, which might be different in the books to the show. Um, one thing before I throw it to you, Aziz, one thing I would say on a sl slightly higher level here, there is a big difference but in... Um, how they are presenting the battle, as in who the battle is between. There's, uh, on, on, in the books, it's very clear that this, yes, there might be an army of the dead coming south, but also we've got, we had Beric, we've got Lady Stoneheart, John's going to be coming back, we've got the mountain. This is not a battle of the living versus the dead there. Um, this is the battle of ice versus fire, but in the show, They've clearly framed this as the living versus the dead. And I can remember there was a great scene, I think it was a, uh, in season seven, when John and Beric were there t having this chat about fighting for the living. And I'm thinking, well, technically, both of you. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so <laughs> yeah. the, uh, I, I think this, this is something they are playing up on the show that is going to be less played up in the books, this idea of the living versus the dead. But what do you think, Jamie, in terms of his fate fighting for the living, what do you think that means? Yeah, I think that's, uh, I think it's probably uh, this conversation with Brienne is my best guess. Um, I, it doesn't seem like he's being grilled in front of a bunch of people. This doesn't seem like a how can we trust you in front of everybody conversation. I could be wrong. And if so, then that's it's as simple as that. If it is that he's just there, like, why should we trust you? But the two issues with that, John 
would not care what Jamie had done. John has made it very clear. It doesn't matter what your, your crimes are. If you're helping us fight the dead, you're cool. That's John's attitude. He's all or nothing. It's it's humans versus the, the undead, and he doesn't care. <laughs> Other than that, everything else is just far below uh, in terms of per, uh, importance. On the other hand, he's not in charge anymore. That's Danny's call. Uh, so maybe Danny will see it differently, be, but because that is the man who killed her father, after all. But Danny has been briefed pretty well on how bad her dad was, and there, there'll be a lot of voices arguing that, no, this guy's here to help. Just let him help fight on our side. And, you know, what's this one guy going to do? How is this one guy going to undermine all of us? You know, he's not a threat, just one guy. So, uh, but yeah, I think it's Brienne. I think he's talking to Brienne. They, promises are a big part of their other arc together. Um, keeping promises and keeping vows. Um, Oathkeeper, right? That's mm -hmm. her, that's the sword that he gave to her. And so... And of course, of all the characters that are going to talk to each other, have conversations, there's just an enormous number of possibilities. Anything from, we were talking about the Crips before, are Gilly and, and uh, Varys going to have a chat while they're down there in the Crips together? That would be awesome. I don't know exactly what they talk about, but that's not a pairing I'd ever really thought about having a conversation. But we, but more likely, we're going to see some expected conversations. And Jamie and Brienne talking is, an, uh, is a slam dunk, right? Like that may not be what we saw in the trailer, but we know it's going to happen. So it, there's a good chance it is what we saw in the trailer. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I like his acting a lot. I think he's one of the, you know, this is a show that has phenomenal acting in general, but I, I consistently rank him near the top. So I'm glad to see him getting these character moments, right? Uh, these these uh, we talk about the the human heart and conflict with itself, which which um, is perfect for describing what's what Jamie's situation. Um, but also, it's kind of a funny thing to think about when you're talking about the undead, <laughs> the human heart. <laughs> what about the dragon heart in conflict with? It? What about the lion? What about the undead? Uh, the unbeating heart in conflict with itself. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I I I agree completely, and I think that he's his particularly on the show, his sort of journey has been and has been fantastic. And, and his kind of the facial acting that he and Brienne do is is just um, exceptional. Yeah, yeah. That is, uh, we know exactly what's going on between the two of them without them ever having to say it. And that's that's an, an exceptional talent to have. Um, uh, John uh, Del Vento, uh, thank you so much for the Super Chat, saying in honor of LML's presence. Welcome, LML, to the chat. Um, mm -hmm. uh, he, <laughs> immediately under that, LML is saying, I see the RLJ discussion is going well. Uh, yes, we've not got to that yet. We're going to do that in the <laughs> second half of this. We thought the trailer's <laughs> here. We will discuss the trailer first. So, uh, we, but we will get to uh, R plus L equals J soon, I, uh, I promise you. And I hope your haircut went well, as did your birthday, LML. Uh, because mm -hmm. we have this kind of weird psychic bond, I also got my haircut today. Um, <laughs> Uh, we had a couple of other super chats. I'm going to quickly pick up on. Um, oh, one from uh, LML uh, again. Uh, Six dollars sixty-six. Thank you so much. Um, I think the whole White Walkers target is the Weirwood Net itself, which probably means Bran too. They want to get to the Isle of Faces and freeze the trees. Yeah. So I kind of touched on this as a possibility. I think my my only uncertainty with this is whether or not they will actually go down the Isle of Faces route on the show because they've not really mentioned it on the show. Uh, they might have done in passing. But the idea that this is, uh, uh, you know, that the, the pact isn't really being mentioned as a thing, um, the, 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 the green men haven't really been mentioned as a thing, it's not been raised as, as something that we're going to come back to that's really important in the way that it is in the books. So... I think uh, I agree that the the if it's not Bran, then it's the Children of the Forest slash the Weirwood Net, as you say. Bran is a part of that now, um, but uh, I, I I hope we see the other faces, but I fear we might not. Um, what 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 do you make of that one, Aziz? I, I feel somewhat similarly. I think that um, I'll, just real quick, I also want to throw out that some people in the chat mentioned baby Sam as a, some as the target, which is an interesting idea because they 
or were used to, they would have expected baby Sam to be given to them because of it would be coming from Craster. But the walkers have been active since well before that Craster business. Uh, so I don't know that that works. Um, but yeah, to, but to answer the question, yeah, I think 100% that's what's happening in the books. I think it's been heavily foreshadowed. The Dance of the Dragons foreshadows it with Aemon versus Daemon fighting over the God's Eye with a pair of dragons going down into it, which I think is highly likely to be what happens. I know a lot of people don't want to hear this, but I think Danny goes down there uh, with that. Um, she kind of sacrifices herself to save humanity. Um, not Nissa Nissa style where John stabs her through the heart, but where she willingly goes into battle against a foe that she probably can't beat uh, without dying. Although, you know, the same goes for that foe. They both die. But, uh, and of course, Eamon in that scene, Eamon has a sapphire eye even. So it's just, Rick, the symbol, the symbolism's pretty overwhelming. Uh, so I think yes for the show, for the books. But the show, it's it's more of a toss up. I think you're right that that's a, it's, a, it's a strong counter argument that they haven't talked about the Isle Faces at all on the show or very, very little. But they could introduce it. It's not too late for that, even though I agree with you in general that they're not going to introduce new, a lot of new plot points. They could introduce one or two. Uh, okay. And this could be it. You know, this, this would be a, a thing they could do. But if they're just going after one person, if that's the thing, then that might, they might just center it around that. They might just center it around going after Bran and that being the thing that matters. They want to kill off the line of green seers, maybe. They want to get rid of that uh, rather than destroying this place which hasn't been mentioned so yeah i, I i'm with you uh, maybe uh, maybe i'm a little less maybe i'm a little more optimistic than you that it could happen in the show but generally if i had to vote i would say it's not going to go that way I, i'm going to say i'm going to say they're going to focus on the character side of this and, and target Bran, and uh maybe not go any deeper than that yeah i think i think i'm with you there i think on the show they will target Bran in the books, it's a lot more to do with their their creation and uh, the Weirwood Net and the Isle of Faces. I think that that's yeah. where they're going to go with that. Uh, Linda Prasuta, that's a very generous super chat. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, if the Night King touched Bran, I think this is an excellent question as well. If the Night King touched Bran as a means to find and kill Blood Raven, then target Bran. Could the White Walkers get into the crypts if Bran is there since he's been touched? So this is the the idea that uh, if you think mm. back a couple of seasons, uh, when uh, the, the Night King grabbed hold of Bran in the vision, that seemed to break whatever spell, protective spell there was around Blood Raven's cave. The White Walkers could come in because Bran was in there and there was some kind of link. Now... The, the thinking at the time was that perhaps this would also help with getting them across the wall because Bran goes back on the other side of the wall, they can then cross it because the wall, although we think of it as this physical barrier, it's actually a magical barrier that they just have a physical thing uh, built on top of effectively. Um, so I think that's a really good question, whether or not this kind of link, this bond has carried forward and will therefore allow the White Walkers down into the crypts. I think I think they've not played up. The one thing I would say to start with is they've not played up this idea of that uh, that link allowing the Night King to pass over places since they left Blood Raven's cave. They didn't talk about the magical that the wall being a magical barrier when it came down. It seems to be just you throw. Um, ice dragon fire at it or whatever we're calling it uh, and then <laughs> across the the, 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 the breach um, so yes I, I like the idea personally but I don't think they've shown that bond they've, they've teed it up to allow us to to go there but Aziz what do you think yeah um, I think I agree I'm not sure I have anything else to add to it but yeah I think that's uh, I think you summarized it pretty well Awesome. Uh, okay, we've got a couple more questions, I think, on the uh, trailer before we move on. Um, okay. Uh, let's just quickly pick up on this super chat. Bridget Walsh, Walsh, thank you so much. Could you do a traveler's guide to Rhaegar and Lyanna's journey? I know mm. I am one of the people who romanticize them. The 
multitasking is uh, impressive, by the way, uh, uh, talking and writing. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually quite quite a hard thing to do, all of this uh, live streaming, reading what people are doing, uh, uh, trying to chat in the room um, and uh, all the rest of it. It's uh, my my brain struggles to keep up sometimes. But in terms of Traveller's Guide to Regan Liana's Journey, yeah, I really like the idea, uh, the idea of doing Traveller's Guides of people's journeys. I think that's fantastic. The problem we have with Regan and Liana's Journey is we don't know what it was. Um, now, we can speculate. We know where they started. We know that they started close to Harren Hall. I personally think the Inn at the Crossroads makes the most sense as the place where they uh, started off. We know that they ended up at the Tower of Joy, just on the Prince's Pass uh, in North of Dawn. And uh, the, the implication is that they went from A to B without really stopping they might have gone via somewhere like Summer Hall. Rhaegar was kind of addicted to the place, but we don't know. So uh, I love the idea. I don't think I could do it for that journey without huge speculation about what they were up to. The only thing I will say I'm reasonably certain of is they didn't go down the King's Road because Brandon was charging really fast after them. And I think he would have caught them up. Yeah, it's not uh, the way you go you. if you're trying to be avoided. <laughs> no, exactly. They were trying to stay uh, off grid at that time. Yeah. Um, uh, Maura Lee had a couple of questions about the trailer. Um, I right. think Maura, we've covered your first one about Arya, who she's running from, whether she's running to get away from someone or pursuing it. So I think you you raised the idea of her being a bait, um, uh, which I think we we kind of like the idea of. Yeah. Um, I didn't, then, I didn't have that idea yesterday for our stream, and I like it. I wish we had talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. Then we've got this um, thought that apparently Gemma asked a perhaps rhetorical question, uh, but I think it's worth having a quick chat about. We get this, uh, the voiceover from Bram, who's saying, everything you, that you did brought you where you are now, where you belong home. Now, I and I suspect most other people will just immediately think this is him talking to John. Um, probably during that conversation when um, he says, oh, by the way, Danny's your aunt. Uh, <laughs> uh, Sorry, and, dude, you banged your aunt. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And he's trying to refocus him on what's really happening and saying, you know, everything that happened, you know, that was all part of a plan, bringing you to where you are right now to do what you're supposed to be doing. Even the that, incest was part of the plan? Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, this is, this, this, is, this is the question, you see. So, so Gemma is proposing, I don't know whether she, I haven't watched the video, but apparently she was suggesting the possibility or asking the question, what if he was talking to the Night King, not Whoa. to uh, to John? This is based, I assume, on the idea that the Night King is almost certainly a Stark, um, uh, or at least a, uh, one of the first men, and that therefore could well be his home. In the books, the Night's King, it is hinted, was a Stark. Um, we get old man who sort of suggests that as a, as a strong possibility that he was a Stark. And so that might be bringing him back home. So um, wh wh what do you think? Do you think that's a possibility? Do you think that Bran is going to be having little pep talk chats with the Night King? Do you think this is, might be a, a slightly less feisty way to end things that, that Bran is actually talking to him? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um... I think that he's, uh, my guess is going to be, my be guess is that he's never going to speak. Um, I think that they de they tried to work up a language for the White Walkers. The same guy, David uh, Peterson, who wrote Dothraki and High Valyrian, also wrote Scroff, but they decided not to use it. And uh, part of that was just it didn't sound right. But the idea is that they don't, uh, the, uh, the original intent was that they don't speak the common tongue either. Um, and yeah, I'm pretty skeptical about how that could happen, especially because we also have this reveal from the Night King actor that he's targeting somebody. And since our best guess is Bran, I just don't see them having a conversation. <laughs> I think he wants yeah. to kill him. And if he's sending whites after him, yeah. Uh, my, my kind of off the cuff guess here 
that you know non John non Arya guess is Jamie uh, because Jamie would be it would be kind of weird for I mean you know actually no he says home doesn't he yeah, yeah. So it can't be Jamie that can't be never mind that's not a pot that's not possible if he says the word home that can't be Jamie because it would be because Jamie and Bran have to have a conversation you know Jamie's would have to apologize and Bran will say oh I don't care I'm not Bran anymore <laughs> but, yeah. something like that yeah. So, so, uh, so scratch that. That can't be it since he says home. So I guess we just, I'll just stick with John on that. It could be Arya, but I'll stick with, I'm gonna stick with John uh, Stark. I don't think it's, I don't think, I don't think there's enough. I think that's just too, over, a little over the top for him to talk to Night King, but it's cool. It's a fun idea, but I'll have to say yeah. no. I'm with you. I think a hundred, well, let's say 95% on that one. I, th I think I agree. Uh, it's almost certainly talking to John, I think I love the idea of there being conversations between the Night King and Bran or someone like that, so that we don't just end up with a big battle to see who's the best and therefore wins. Um, but I don't think it will happen quite like that if it does. Um, Peg Lake Pete, while we're talking about Bran, um, here's one for you, Aziz, about Bran's powers. Can Bran share his visions of the past with other people? If someone say holding his hand, will they be able to see the past as well? Um, well, in the books, we see Blood Raven kind of get in Bran's head and then help him get into John's head. He like connects them. Uh, it's almost like Star Wars, where there's that forced thing where they can see each other. Uh, so I don't think we can say for sure. But I think it's entirely possible, given uh, that, given that we've seen that sort of done in the books, um, even if it's just the one time. And but it might need you might need to have it might only be possible for you know a green seer in training or something like that. But John is if if it worked for John in the book, it, it should be possible for Brand to show him the vision in in the show. But that doesn't mean they'll go that route. You know, it, it, I think Brand would just. Brand's word is going to be convincing, especially because Sam has these books to back it up. So I don't know that John needs to see it, but that would be cool because it's it would make it visual, and that's a great way to show it to to on TV. You know, rather than you know show don't tell, that would be kind of that would be yeah. totally. I would like that. I, I don't know that that's what we'll get, but yeah, that's I, I like that idea. Yeah, I think that would be a good way for them to show it. Yeah, I agree, and I think that in terms of well, in terms of Brand's powers, the short answer is we do not know the extent of his powers. Um, they've they've not written down what the list of, of being a green seer exactly means. There are hints in the books. There are hints that he can do more than he can do at that, or will be able to do more than he can do at that time. On the show, he seems to be still trying to figure it all out and understand what's going on. So perhaps he will be able to do more. And it certainly makes sense. Pardon me. It certainly makes sense to me that that is the kind of thing he will be able to do. Um, uh, but. Um, I think I had another thought on that one. I can't remember what it was now. <laughs> um, oh, I, yeah. So oh, no, I, was, I think I was just going to agree that um, John, we have to imagine the scene where John gets told um, what his true parentage is um, and he com comes up there and how is he actually convinced of this fact? And yes, sure, we can have um, Sam saying, well, yeah, I mean, there's we got a marriage... A certificate from these two people over here and we got Bran saying well I saw it in a vision is that going to be enough to persuade John perhaps but I think that it I agree with you it makes a lot more sense if they can show him not just tell him stuff that they've discovered themselves um Stannis Baratheon asks um and thank you for the super chat by the way does the Golden Company betray Cersei I know they never break contracts but a dragon still a dragon red or black now my take on this is that the the golden company so they've taken out all of the fagon aegon and blackfire bit yeah. out of the show that's that's not in there so i think we have to treat the golden company as if they were effectively just a, a large really quite cool looking cell sword unit they're not there they did look cool they did look really cool, but they're not there with all this kind of like uh, back history going back to sort of Aegol Rivers and, and, and sort of Black, Blackfire Rebellions and all the rest of it. That's not what they're about, I think, on the show. Or that's They might sort of hint at it, but it's not uh, because 
we haven't got this second invasion happening across from uh, from Fagon Aegon, then I think that we're in a in a situation where they're just going to be used as a uh, a, a, a new army for Cersei. Uh, in terms of are they going to betray her? Well, um, perhaps at the end they might in a way that everybody might betray Cersei. I could certainly see her there effectively on her own at the very end. I could see how that could happen, but I don't think they're going to betray her because they are supporting a Blackfire pretender or anything along those lines. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on the Golden Company other than them looking cool? <laughs> is there, I mean, is there anything else to say? That's all that matters. No. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I agree. Maybe they'll betray Cersei because not only has their um, backstory since, because since their backstory hasn't really been brought into the show, their nobility, their not breaking contracts part didn't carry over either. So we don't have to, re we don't have to think of them as some ultra trustworthy sellsword company that's different than the rest. I mean, I think that's been mentioned, but I don't think they made a big deal out of it. So if the show wants to have Cersei be betrayed, no one's gonna be like, oh my God, I can't believe the sellsword company betrayed her. Um, but on the other hand, if they do betray her, I think it might be more along the lines of let's get the hell out of here, not we're turning on you. You know, yeah. uh, if, if things are they're like, we don't want any part of this undead business. We're being paid to be here. We don't live here. See ya. <laughs> and yeah. if they could, especially if they can think to themselves, well, and Cersei's probably going to die, especially if we leave her. So who's going to come uh, after us for breaking this contract, you know? Uh, I don't know. It's it's so hard to say because you're right. They're just kind of being. There's so little to backstory to them, and we we just kind of naturally fill in the gaps from what we know from the books because we have nothing else to go on. But I think it's probably a mistake to think too much of their book version. I really I think it's mostly just a cool name that they've borrowed, and the the concept of a large sellsword company. I'm not sure that there's any much else to it. Uh, Again, apart from them looking awesome, which we shouldn't, <laughs> we have, we can't forget. <laughs> no, we, we, we can't, and we, we shouldn't forget. Uh, Klaus Richter, um, uh, 10 euros, thank you so much. Uh, George R. R. Martin has always made it very clear that he doesn't like just evil or just good characters. What about the Night King? Is he the personified evil? Does he have to die? No, I, well, I agree completely. George R. R. Martin, he signs up completely to this idea that um uh, that everyone is a hero in their own story um nobody wakes up in the morning thinking hey i'm going to go and do evil they they think that they're justified in what they're doing and that applies equally well to the night king and the white walkers as it does to any of the other characters so my take on this one is that uh, we're going to learn just a little bit more about their backstory here enough to make us go, ah, oh, yeah, I kind of understand where they're coming from. So it, just in terms of show canon, what we've got at the moment, we already, if you start to try and think of it from their position, they, or at least the first one, the, the Night King, we assume, was a human and then got trapped in some kind of icy cold undeath forever. That in and of itself is the kind of thing that might make you a little bit angry. So you wanting a little bit of re uh, revenge. So immediately you get, you get into this idea that there's something they're wanting. They, I can pretty much guarantee in the books, and I um, certainly hope it's the case on the show as well, uh, that the White Walkers are not just there to... Uh, kill humans because they just want to kill humans. That's not what this is about. There's another level to this. There's another thing here that makes you go, oh, I understand the motivation for this. That's not just that they're wanting to do bad things. Yeah. Um, go on, Aziz. You, you must have thoughts about the, the, the Night King and being a evil or not evil or multi-layered yeah. character. I, I'm not sure there's a lot of depth to him, but I also agree that even uh, even... George's most evil characters have a little bit of nuance to them, but I also want to push back a little bit against the idea that he doesn't do pure evil or pure pure good. I think he, well, I don't think he does pure good. I've, there's nobody, at least no. he hasn't done that, that we've seen. But pure evil is a little different, maybe, and it depends on your de definition of pure evil. 
but you can't really get much more evil than Ramsey or Gregor uh, or Joffrey. And sure, there's reasons for them being that way, but they don't excuse it. Like Joffrey is how he was, but Marcella and Tommen aren't. So it's not, you can't just blame the parenting. Sir Gregor has his headaches, but lots of people have migraines that don't turn into murderous savage beasts. You know, I, I don't think that's enough of an explanation. So there's nuance to those characters, but it doesn't excuse them. They're still evil. Uh, so I think they're, what George is against is having everything be about good and evil. He's against the good guys versus the bad guys being uh, a trope that's just too common because even the good guys are sometimes bad and even the good bad guys are sometimes good. Now, when it comes to the the, the living versus the dead, it is it is kind of evil versus good. And uh, mm, I don't know that, I think there's a reason that the Night King exists but I don't know that he has a lot of uh, agency because we know the children of the forest made them and they had, a, you know, and they did this according to the show because they were, uh, you know, it was, it was a last resort. They were, they were being killed off themselves and they had to do something. They needed a, a weapon to fight back. And this was their weapon to fight back with. And it got out of hand. It's not the weapon, you know, developed its own intelligence. It's like an AI gone crazy or something like that. Uh, it's like it's like a Terminator, <laughs> but um, even in the Terminator, they had a purpose, right? They had they wanted to wipe life out, not because they hated life, but because they, you know, or like the Matrix, where they just they thought their way was better. <laughs> they thought that yeah. their vision of making a world for robots was superior. Um, so I think that they're they're just carrying out their initial primary function, which was to fight the hum fight humanity because that's what they were built to do and it's kind of gotten out of control um and they're still doing that so uh there's some philosophy behind it all what you consider pure evil what you consider good um but i largely agree with the, the way that the take on good evil here but I, I don't think that means there's a lot of depth to night king i would be it would be cool though if it if, if there is more depth to night king i'd be really happy with that i just not i'm setting my expectations lower i think there's if we don't get that depth in the book i'll be very disappointed because there, <laughs> should, there needs to be more explanation and we want it george knows we want it it would be really cool to give that to us even if he leaves some mysteries like i don't think we get a full explanation but we're gonna know more than we do now and i think we'll know a lot more than we do now so yeah, yeah. I, I i agree um uh, Linda Prasuta, uh, thank you. And another very generous super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, where, oh, where is Howland Reed? Uh, mm. had this, uh, I mean, you know I love Howland Reed. Um, I, I think I love him more in his absence than his presence, if anything. Um, in, I, th I think he is, he is in Grey Water Watch. He's, he's at, at home, basically. Um, and I think that's the case in both the books and on the show. In the books, George R. R. Martin has told us that, yes, he is going to appear at some point because he knows so much. And he is going to reappear. My best guess in the books is that Major Mormont has gone off, has been sent there. And this is what Rob sent, sent her and her, another couple of people off just to find... Uh, him uh, and I think that she will um, br bring him back up to Winterfell at the right time so I think that's what's going to happen in the books on the show they've not really made a big deal about Howland they didn't yes they showed him in the flashback to the Tower of Joy but they didn't really sort of make a big deal about who it was there were a couple of little mentions from Mira last season that, that gave me a little bit of hope she name checked him when she was asked when she was trying to get across uh, through the wall, uh, she said that she was Mira Reed, daughter of Howland Reed. And then when she headed off, she said she was going home. So <coughs> the, it's possible that we might see Howland, but I don't think he's going to be a major character on the show because they've not built him up to be a major character. I think that he might appear uh in the background somewhere hello uh that kind of thing in the same way that they gave us a nod they showed us dawn the the sword dawn there lingered on it for a second or two they lingered on uh the what presumably was the horn of winter in the cache of dragon glass they the shot lingered on there for a while so they could show the book people that yes they know these are important things but they're just that they haven't got time to explain them all so it wouldn't surprise me if we see Howland Reed, but I don't think 
he's going to have a huge role to play in this. Um, Aziz, what do you reckon about about Howland? Is he going to turn up somewhere? I I would really like him to, but no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think the it was very ominous when they just had Miro exit stage left the way they did. Even though she said she was going to her family, it really felt like parting. And we're pretty sure, I hope this isn't a spoiler, we're pretty sure she wasn't cast. I'm not sure that she wasn't. So uh, I guess it's not necessarily a spoiler because I didn't like dig really deep to confirm that. But yeah, I don't even, so if, if Mira's not in it, then maybe Howland appears. Maybe there's a brief appearance of him. I'm just not holding out much hope, but I, I would love for it to, I would love to be wrong. Oh, I guess I'm not wrong. I'm not saying no. I just don't expect it. So I, I would love to uh, love for my instinct to be uh, off here and, and for them to surprise us. But it's also kind of yeah. hard, hard to see what he would do. Um, it would be neat for him to tell us things, but what do we need him to what, what What does he know that we can't get from Bran? Um, I, th I think that's the, for, for me, that's the thing is that on the show, they've taken Bran and Sam and they're going to be the people revealing stuff uh and the books will get a whole lot more from howland is my gut instinct um mod mary thank you so much uh what if cersei sends the golden company to winterfell and they all arrive at the same time the night king army does that's not her plan her plan was to let the the two armies in the north uh danny's army and the night king's army fight each other and just like she would then only have one enemy to face afterwards that will be hopefully quite diminished so no i don't think personally i don't think that's going to happen i think she will use it to secure the south um so that after the battle uh, then she's going to be in control of all of the south uh, tiffany rothwell saying what if the burn them all bit uh, wasn't a mistake on Blood Raven's part. What if it was a well orchestrated orchestrated <laughs> trap for the Night King? Lure them in and burn them all. Yeah, I mean, I I still like this idea that perhaps Blood Raven tried to contact uh, Aerys and uh, was trying to tell him something, and the only thing which came through uh, was this idea of burning them all. But um, I don't think we. Um, I don't think we have enough there. I don't think that certainly on the show they've played up Blood Raven's role in history as enough for that to be a matter. I think they see the, the Mad King and Aerys's history that doesn't really impact on the story as a whole. In the books, I think it's very different. Uh, in my uh, series on Robert's Rebellion, Tower of Joy and all the rest of it, the last one I do is going to be my If In Doubt Blame Blood Raven video, and it's going to be <laughs> epic length, and it's going to be every way that I think that he's been manipulating events all the way through that whole period, and I think there was a huge amount of manipulation from him there. Uh, so I think it's a very different story in the books. I think that he did a whole lot of amount of stuff there that hasn't come up um, so much on the show. He was effectively just uh, the tree wizard who could train Bran. Uh, but as he's on, uh, why don't you pick one of those to answer? How about the Golden Company going to Winterfell or uh, burn them all and Blood Raven? What do you reckon? Yeah, I don't know about the the burn them all Blood Raven one. That's interesting to me. I think that um, I like Joe Magician's theory that Ares was when Ares thought that the he would rise as a dragon that he was having a vision of Danny, and that's what Danny he was seeing Danny and he thought it was himself. Uh, Cause that is what Danny did. She did you yeah. know, kind of go into a fire and come out alive. And that may have been something that other Targaryens prior to Ares dreamt of. It's just, they were a little less uh, crazy than him. So they didn't take it quite as literally. Um, but as far as, yeah, burn them all uh, as a, as a reference to blood Raven telling them to, that seems like a stretch to me um, that just, it's so, so, so specific. The idea that he was trying to communicate with Ares, but only this one phrase got through. Mm. I, I, I don't I don't know about that. It seems like he had so long to communicate with Ares. Ares had a long life, and I, I find that a little incredible that he could only ever get through with that. You know, like he would have had plenty of time to to, to communicate with him. He could have gotten in his dreams over the course of several decades, and of course, he wasn't insane at, from birth, as from what we know, he was relatively sane in his teens and his early twenties. It, it was it was a uh, gradual decline that he had, and. Um, some people, I know some people like to suggest that his gradual decline was because of these dreams and because of Bloodraven getting in his head. But to me, that's that's taking it too far. Maybe Bloodraven 
could have encouraged that. Maybe Blood Raven helped pushed him along a little bit, but uh, the idea that he caused his madness by himself is definitely too much for me. Uh, it's the same thing with blaming parentage for Joffrey being his way. Um, no, I can't explain everything because not all because his brother and sister didn't turn out that way, <laughs> and you know, et cetera. There's yeah. just there's just the other. It, it can explain part of it, but it can't be the whole reason. And because it's so specific, um, and because there would have been so much time for a different message to get through, I, I, I'm skeptical on that. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, I wouldn't say that Blood Raven was solely responsible for making the Mad King mad. I don't. That's not. Um, uh, that's not really where I would come from on that. But as as a contributing factor, I certainly think it's possible. Yeah, it's cool. Um, it's a cool idea. I like it. Yeah, Maza Monte, your super chat's just gone off the top of my thing, but I think it was asking about why Cersei might have been crying. Uh, she sort of like looked like she was half smiling, half crying just before she took a sip of wine. I think that my, uh, was it news about Jamie? I think that we have to accept that there are now only very few things which will get to Cersei's heart. One yeah. of those is Jamie. Um, and so, and the other is this apparent pregnancy that she's got. Uh, so it's something to do with that. It's something to do with one of the very few things that gets close to her heart. The idea that Jamie has gone all the way up to the north and betrayed her. Yeah, that's entirely possible. If she is pregnant and she loses the child in some way, that also could lead to that reaction, uh, in my view. Um, Kathy Stark uh, asked, what's going on? on over in Essos is winter spreading any white walkers heading towards the five forts or Yeti we do not know is the short answer um they've not told us anything about that I not as, as far as I'm aware they're not going to be taking season um uh, eight over to Essos uh, there might be a few little things here and there but Certainly on the show, the battle is going to be very much focused in on Westeros. In the books, I think it might well be different. I think that we may well see, as we saw, that well, the legends of the old Long Night were that, yes, it very much carried over into Essos. So I think we might see the same thing happen there in the books, but not so much uh, on the show, I don't think. Um, Aziz, what do you think? Do you think we're going to see anything of Essos? Not in the show, no. I think um, the only remotely SOC thing we're going to get besides the Golden Company is that Melisandre's got to pop back up at some point. And she wasn't in the trailer unless she was in there very sneakily, So, uh, which sort of implies that she's maybe coming a little later. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, they just have so much to do and not a whole lot of time. And none of the main characters are in Essos. The only one there is Mel Sandra. I wouldn't call her a main character, maybe a secondary a character. So, yeah, I, I'm yeah. very skeptical. But the idea that there, but I feel the exact opposite about the book. I mean, there is a lot already happening on the books, even though we're, you know, well back in the timeline uh, and the progress of the story. There's uh, slave revolts. There's the red priest, the head red priest calling Danny Azor Ahai openly Azor Ahai. And uh, you've got Makoro in Slaver's Bay you know, kind of running that agenda and you've got the Bravosi uh, situation. You've got uh, the Tattered Prince wants Pentos. There's just so much, there's, there's plenty going on there. And Danny is still an Essos in, in the book. So there's time for that to happen. Whereas, you know, Danny's not in Essos <laughs> in the show. So it's kind of, to me, that's it. There's nobody there that really matters anymore. I mean, we're not we're not supposed to sit here and thinking that Dario is going to get his own plot line, right? <laughs> no, so, no. So I just don't see it. I would. It would be cool if we got Essos, but yeah, I'm I'm pretty dubious. Um, okay, general, I'm going to yeah. round off. Uh, sorry to interrupt, disease. I'm going to round off the discussion of the the trailer. We've kind of moved away from the trailer kind of into kind of general season eight territory anyway, uh, because I wanted to talk about. R plus L equals J. We had just yeah. sort of uh, nine nickels. I saw your super chat there saying, what do you think this is to sort of round off that first bit of conversation? What do you think is going on with a collapsed level of the crypt? Do you think this was done purposefully to hide something or keep something inside? Um, 
my take on that, I did a video a while ago called um, something like The Horn of Winter and the Crypts of Winterfell or something along those lines. My take is that the Horn of Winter is what uh, can be blown to raise the Stark dead. Now, mm. my take, therefore, um, I've got a long, there's a long bit of logic that leads up to that point, so I'm just giving you sort of the headlines here. Uh, but my take is that the Night's King, we're told that he was the 13th Lord Commander, which seems to imply that if, they, if that was set up around the same time as House Stark, then there will be a few generations of Starks who would have been buried in the bottom level of the crypts. If that first battle against the Night's King involved raising some Stark dead, then that makes sense to me that that might be why they collapsed that old early part of it, just to sort of hide off that bed. And also, incidentally, if the Night's King himself, as a Stark, were buried there, his name was expunged from history, so this would make sense that they just buried all of that bit where the old Starks came up, did their thing, um, uh, and then they sort of just like got rid of all evidence of what happened. So that's my high level take of what, what that is, is that um, uh, the Horn of Winter has been used before. It didn't bring down the wall. There's no hints that it brought down the wall. It did in fact raise uh, giants from the earth, figuratively being the dead Starks. Uh, but Aziz, just before we move on to R plus L equals J, what 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 do you think about the that collapsed level of the Winterfell crypt? Um, I'm I think this my cat here is more interested in giving his answer. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wonder about that too. The collapse the collapsed level is fascinating because with that it gives you the idea maybe that there's a tunnel that leads outwards or some other way in um, from the outside somehow. And it also could be, it would be where you have the answer to some really interesting questions like, is Brandon the Builder buried in the crypts? <laughs> you know, things like that. Oh, or, you know, is there a spot in between where the Night King would have been had he been, a, you know, had he been uh, buried in Winterfell uh, if he was really a Stark? Um, things like that. Uh, and what did they put, like, what kind of, how did the old crypts look? But yeah, I think it all kind of ties into the possibility of all this is kind of set up or or maybe framing for the more of a climactic moment with the dead rising. And uh, but it's so hard to envision how that's going to happen. Like, what form are they going to take? Like, how what what is a three thousand year old corpse? Like, can that even does, is there any flesh there even to animate? <laughs> I guess that would be why they're in this deep dark cellar where they maybe don't decompose. It's always been funny to me that the Starks are the one house that buries their dead openly, you know, keeps these bodies. They're the one house that should be burning. <laughs> the dead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All there's, the other a, there's, a reason that, there's a reason they're there. Um, I have to say. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, <laughs> I'm just wanting to move on, but then Klaus Richter comes up with a super chat linked to this, which is what did Brandon the breaker break? Um, in that same video that I just named a moment ago, I had my theory that he broke the Horn of Winter because the, the, the horn that I think others often think as well is the Horn of Winter, the one that Sam has got. It is described as being broken and it makes perfect sense to me that after it being used, if they're destroying all evidence of, of what happened, they would also break the horn that uh, that could do that. Um, not in a way that destroys it forever, just in case they need to, but prevent magically breaking it in some way. Because if you look at that horn, or when Sam looked at it, they couldn't, John looked at it, they couldn't actually see anything wrong with it. Uh, it wasn't particularly broken, cracked, kind of broken. It was, they blew it, it should have worked, but it was described as being broken. And that, for me, is a really odd word to use for something that isn't actually physically broken uh, in some way. So I think that's what it was. I think he may well have broken other things. He might well have broken promises and all the rest of it. But I think that is where he got his moniker from. Uh, do you have any uh, thoughts on that? 
No, I like that theory a lot, and I don't have a, a better alternative beyond ones that have kind of are generally thrown out uh, already. So I'll have to think about that one more. I actually haven't considered him as breaking the horn. That's a good idea. Yeah, it, it all it, for me, it all ties in. Uh, I have to say the 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 horn, the crypts of winter, the break, the the breaker, the um, uh, the, the 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 reason why the Starks have to be buried there. But I I could get a slightly uh, onto a big big digression there than I want. Let's move on to R plus L equals J because this was the what I was wanting to talk about initially. Um, uh, Aziz, by the way, just shout if you need to go at some point. I, I forgot to ask how long we have you for. Oh, we're um, fine. Oh, excellent news. Well, we'll charge on then. Um, got a whole load of questions from my patrons, as uh, as always. I'm going to start off with a fantastic, slightly more left-field one here from Torsten D, saying, just to play devil's advocate, is John's burnt hand that he is constantly flexing in the books. This is the hand that he got burned in book one. He uh, When he saves uh, Lord Commander Mormont, then his hand gets burnt um, and it hurts him a lot. He, 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 um, he seems, I can't remember the exact words, but he's, he's in agony over it quite a lot. Uh, and he still kind of flexes it and looks at it things during the, through the books. Is that a constant reminder that he is not a Targaryen, or at least not a, a dragon like Danny. So, what what do you think? What's going on with the hand? It's clearly there's something going on with the hand. What do you think? What do you think is going on there? Okay. Um, the as far as the 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 Targaryen aspect of it, we see plenty of Targaryens get burned. So, I think sometimes people make a little too much of that. I think Danny is the special one, not Targaryens. What we we get a sense that they are maybe a little bit heat resistant, but not fire resistant. And Danny, even Danny's um, dragon hatching has been declared by George to be a, a miracle uh, or the equivalent to a miracle. So I'm not sure that we can read a whole lot into John's hand burning, but it's fun to think about and how he uh, it impacts his, his uh, early arc. And it's a good kind of counterpoint to the mystery of his parentage. If somebody is thinking about it, especially at that point in the book, if you think about it in chronologically in the way that Order George presents this information, you're getting that um, this is Clash of Kings, or this is still Game of Thrones. This is still book one. So it's these are all, a lot of this is still early mystery stuff. Um, something that a, lot, a few of these things George might have, you know, write, written slightly different if he had it to do all over again because the world hadn't been fully expanded yet. Some of the, uh, you know, using his gardener style. Well, not everything had grown in, yet. Uh, so, you know, back then he still thought it would be three books. <laughs> so it's interesting to look at the early foreshadowing and wonder about George's original intent because it's possible that it's changed. I mean, there's some very glaring examples from the very early chapters and the, this is a little, I wouldn't call this scene where he burns his hand the very early chapters. This is more, I think it's more towards the middle of book one. Mm. And certainly it's in the middle of season one. But uh, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I don't know, I, don't, I, guess it's not, I guess it's not too telling, but there's these interesting, there's, there's probably going to be more to come in that regard. Like one thing I'm, I brought up in regards to these many Jon Snow, Aegon the Third parallels is that Aegon III has, has this long uh, arc in Fire and Blood where he's helping the sick. He's he's tending to people with winter fever, which gives Danny vibes, right? Of Danny tending the sick in Marine of the bloody flux. But if you think ahead to what's coming in the books, if you believe there'll be a grayscale epidemic that's been foreshadowed in both the North and we've got John Connington having it in the South, well, then John is going to have to deal with grayscale too. And thinking about how that's going to impact him. Well, he might be immune to it par or have partial immunity because he's a Targaryen, but he might have even more immunity because he's dead. <laughs> you know, how does, how do dead people get infected with disease? I don't know that they can. Uh, on the other hand, grayscale is magical. So that's a bit of a grayscale tangent there, but I think um, <laughs> we're talking about John's Targaryen-ness and it all relates to that. So uh, I, I think that, um, I don't know that the burnt hand is, is a sign of his, uh, is supposed to be that, but it, it does kind of muddy the waters w early in the story when people are still trying to maybe noodle that out, which might be yeah. intent. I mean, it, it might be. I mean, if anything, personally, I think this is a hint that he is a Targaryen, um, 
because there's some intriguing language, I think it's in A Dance with Dragons, when uh, John's there and his hand is out and it's smoking, is what is, is being the word that's used for it, which mm. is, is, you know, you wouldn't talk about a hand smoking. You might, you know, there might be steam rising off of it or something like that, but a smoking hand suggests that there's something different going on with his body that perhaps reacts to the cold in an odd way. Um, but uh, yeah, so I don't think it's a hint that he's not a Targaryen because Targaryens can be burned like anyone else. But I think it's possible that it's a hint that he is later on. That, that'll be quite a long um, payoff, the wait for a payoff there in terms of like a, going towards that hint when it's saying smoking. But yeah, I don't know. I, th I think it's just, uh, it, it might just be a sort of a character building thing and a link across between fire and ice. I don't mm -hmm. know, perhaps that's that's a, a thing. He's, be, he's been marked by fire. Um, uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's yeah, that possible. That is how he has to treat it, right? Anything. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and, um, yeah, someone, uh, so Nine Nichols uh, in the chat saying the burnt hand symbolizes being kissed by fire. Um, so, yeah, I think huh. there's, there's, there's that again. Um, okay. uh, let's go with um, Bond's uh, chat. A uh, question from Patreon saying, "In the books, what do you think John's real name will be?" I still still think it will be Aegon. Um, this is so if we're if we're accepting R plus L equals J, and uh, incidentally, I did a, a Twitter poll. I'm, I'm on Twitter. If you want to find me on Twitter, just I have a hunt for In Deep Geek. Did a Twitter poll uh, a couple of days ago just to see the lay of the land what uh, people thought i just asked the simple question who do you think in the books john snow's parents uh were and 90 percent came out uh, saying uh liana and rhaegar i think we had five percent for uh, ashara dane and ned and then the, the other five percent were sort of either don't know or I, I have another theory uh so i think the the overwhelming majority view within the fandom, the community is that uh, R plus L does equal J. So that's that's my the starting point. Um, uh, the video is is up if you want to have a look at it. That was just basically me setting out all the reasons why I think it's the case. Um, but with that as it is, um, what's John's real name? Um, I did a video on this ages ago. Once we had that reveal back in season seven because i think it confused a lot of people because you know, you know there already was an an aegon um that uh, rhaegar had and uh why would you name somebody when there's already somebody else named like that that just doesn't make any sense um my thinking at the time which i think is still still roughly the same is that we have to uh, assume that the naming happened after John was born. So Rhaegar left partway through the pregnancy. We don't know exactly when, but he wasn't around there for the birth. Um, he was convinced he was going to have a daughter. As far as we can tell, he seemed to have been going through this naming convention with uh, naming his children after the three original invading Targaryens. We, it seems likely that he was what he was expecting a daughter to name Visenya. We know that he was very forthright in his beliefs and didn't uh accept the possibility there might be any other way and so i think that he probably left with the instruction this child will be called visenya then he goes away he dies uh his children die including aegon um and liana is left there thinking well what do i name this son if it's a daughter she probably would have named it visenya but it's a son so what what does she do? It actually makes sense to me that she might decide to name the child after Rhaegar's dead beloved son Aegon. So it makes sense to me. I don't. I know it didn't make a lot of sense to some people, but it makes sense to me. And the the crucial point is that this is Lyanna who is doing the naming. George R. R. Martin has said that the name John came from Ned. 
Uh, so he said that's where that name came from, which the implication is that if, if John had a name beforehand, it would have been chosen by Liana. Uh, but what do, you, what do you think, Aziz, in terms of naming for John? Yeah, I, I'm torn because I used to be on fully on Team Eamon for his name, and I still <laughs> think there's more foreshadowing. There's more foreshadowing for Eamon than there is for Aegon, but I think Aegon fits better because... Uh, well, first you have, like you said, your reasoning for Liana naming him Aegon is extremely solid. I don't need, I don't have anything to add to that other than that I will agree with it. But there's that old, the, the, the Aegon theory has existed since 1996 that his real name was Aegon because it's, it's, it's close. <laughs> Aegon. <laughs> uh, just like, and yes, John Aaron is, is what John is named after and Rob is named after Robert Baratheon. So, of course, J Ned named his, these kids after his two important male figures in his life. Um but uh, yeah, so, so here's some of the evidence, right? Eamon, one of the re one of the things that lines up really well for Eamon is he says he thinks of himself as not Eamon Targaryen, and he think, but he also thinks of himself when they're when he and Rob are playing those games uh, of who they who they're trying to emulate as heroes when they're little boys, and Rob yells, "I'm the young dragon," which is yes, <laughs> you are literally the young dragon. You're the young wolf, and your arc totally parallels the young dragons. It's so many, it, it just hits on all these different points. And then John immediately yells, I'm aiming the dragon knight. And well, hmm. <laughs> so, so like I said, the foreshad the early foreshadowing points to Eamon, but the show, which they got from George and the whole parallels in the dance of the dragons, the dance of the dragons is a parallel of two Aegons going at war to war with each other. They're Aegon the Younger and Aegon the Elder. We have this already. It's not like people are like, oh, too many Aegons. Like, nah. There's, there's so many Aegons and Darons. One more isn't going to change that. <laughs> so, uh, and then he gets to be Aegon the Seventh, you know, Aegon the Unknown or Aegon the Undead or whatever you want to call him. It just, it just fits so well with the historical parallels that we've been given. And there's some foreshadowing for it, even though there seems to be more foreshadowing for Aemon. And again, the caveat I said earlier about George's early foreshadowing, and uh, maybe he's changed his mind. Maybe he doesn't, he no longer wants John's name to be uh, Eamon. Maybe he's going to go with Aegon. So I'm going to lean Aegon, even though <laughs> I, uh, I've, I was once on Team Eamon. I think Jaehaerys is right out. I think that's. I think that he would be, it would, it would be nice, but I, I don't think, and none of the evidence points to it. It just is a possibility that people like. But I don't. I yeah. don't see. I think it's a distant third. I mean, I, I like. I like the name Harris and in terms of, I think it would suit an element of his character, the conciliator. That works really well for me. But I agree. There's. There's no particular reason why he should be named the uh, De Harris, or why there's no particular foreshadowing of that either. So, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm sticking with with Aegon as the most likely, um, like the thought of Aemon, but uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm staying on Team Aegon. Um, Catherine Scully, uh, thank you so much for the super chat. The oddest theory I have heard is John being the, oh dear, being the son of the god of law and Lyanna. Um, I think I would agree with you that that's an odd theory. I don't think that the gods will play an active role in this story either in the present or in the past. So I don't think that R'hllor was in some way incarnate and then became uh, the, the the father or the lover of Lyanna or whatever. I don't, I, I, I can't see that at all. So I think I would agree with you uh, completely on that one. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll move on Aziz, unless you wish to particularly uh, fight for R'hllor's cause as the father of Jon Snow. It's it's an it's a cool idea because of the idea you know it's like a it's like an immaculate conception kind of thing <laughs> where but again but I don't I, I think that um, even setting aside the tinfoilness of that I think that Danny is this the one who is the is the one who's going to sacrifice herself to save mankind not John I think John will be a part of it and I think he might live and be traumatized afterwards but I think Danny's the one who's going to is playing all the like Jesus roles in this story, the one who's gonna die for everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, um, that's where I stand on that. No, all good. 
Hillbilly Living, thank you so much for the super chat. I didn't see a question with that one, um, so I'm going to assume there isn't, but somebody please shout if there was and I missed it. Um, Jack Hurst, uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Oh, no, actually, this was a patron question, uh, uh, but um, the super chat, oh, you did a super chat earlier anyway. Uh, definitely thought the most conclusive evidence of the R plus L equals J video was when you reminded us that Dan and Dave answered the question, who's John's mother correctly? and then made a series with that being the case. Do you think anyone not considering all the evidence can still think it's not the case? Um, yeah, so there was quite a lot of chat on one of the, um, following on from one of the tweets I did about this, uh, about whether or not they did conclusively say, or George R. R. Martin did conclusively say that they answered correctly. I think you could potentially interpret that as being that he didn't ever ever precisely say yes they said that it, this was Rhaegar and Lyanna were John's parents and therefore I gave them the, the show on that basis but the clear implication is that that's what they answered and that's what that's part of the reason why George R. R. Martin trusted them to make the show. Uh, in terms of whether I consider uh, whether anyone not considering all the evidence can still think it's not the case um, I think that the evidence personally is overwhelmingly in favour of R plus L equals J. I, I, I can understand why people might want it to be something different, but I think a lot of this uh, desire so often comes from the basis of it seems too obvious or I just don't like it, rather than building up an evidence base. For something else. So, for example, I also I, when I was in the last stages of making the video, I uh, I was having a look around for any evidence I could get. I tweeted out. I asked people any evidence at all that either Ashara Dane or anyone who could possibly have been John's mother was with Ned Stark at the time they would have had to be uh, in order to be his mother. And there literally is none. Nobody has come up with any evidence. There's no hints or rumours or thoughts of a woman, strikingly beautiful woman with purple eyes anywhere near Winterfell or the North at that time. There's there's nothing. So any any argument for that is built on supposition rather than the the evidence, in my view. But I always value alternative views, and I'm never going to shout someone down. Uh, for, for it, I will always listen to alternative views. But for me, the evidence is overwhelmingly R plus L equals J. Aziz, I think this is your your turn to say your your position on how confident you are on R plus L equals J. Yeah, a hundred percent. I don't think I, I I appreciate attempts to delve into alternative theories because it's fun, and I would never tell someone not to have fun playing with this material any way they want to. But I don't, at the same time, that doesn't make it uh, um, compelling, right? You know, a theory isn't compelling because someone likes it. That's, it's, that's a good reason to not mock them. It's a good reason to let them have fun in whatever way they want. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that it, it's a good theory, right? <laughs> you know, there's two different, that, that's the same thing. You can be polite, you can be kind, you can be respectful, but that doesn't mean you're bought in. Uh, and that's where I come. I don't buy into any of the alternative theories. I think they all fall apart under scrutiny. And that what's uh, one of the most important things when theorizing, I'm going to soapbox just for a little bit. <laughs> Go for it. It's soapboxing. <laughs> There's a little bit of, it's always important for a theory to work. It has to have three elements, like a tripod. It doesn't stand unless it has three feet. Those three feet are, it has to have evidence, of course, it has to have uh, evidence in the text. It has to be proven in that sense. It has to have supporting evidence like that. It has to be compelling from, uh, be supported, you know, in all those senses. But the most, I don't I don't really need to talk about the, the two normal ways. The one I want to focus on is the literary analysis, which is, it has to make literary sense. John, most of these other theories about John's parentage do not fit the story that we're being told. They do not fit George's style. They do not fit George's, uh, the foreshadowing that's been laid out. They do not fit the um, the way his storytelling patterns work. There's just so much that just they don't that they don't work. And, and a lot of the common arguments that uh, against it are, um, it's too obvious. 
it is not too obvious. <laughs> People who say it's R plus L equals J are too obvious, I think have been in this too long to forget what it's like to be a reader who doesn't have a lot of friends that read this story. And uh, a lot of people have, I've been in this fandom since 2001. And let me tell you, the number of people who didn't catch Jon Snow was uh, Liana and Rhaegar's kid through the first read is huge, huge, including myself. There, I mean, so many people I talked to did not catch that. And people are sitting here, oh, it's obvious. No, it is not obvious. It's only obvious now because it's 2019 and everyone knows it. <laughs> but in 2001, in, in 1996, in 1998, when those books were new, no, not for, not at all. <laughs> it wasn't, it certainly wasn't obvious then. It was hardly talked about at all. It was a, a theory that people were pushing rather than a theory that everyone, almost everyone accepts. So yeah. All right. Off the soapbox. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm, I'm confident. And, uh, I again, I'll repeat that I don't have any problem with people debating it, but I'm not. Um, like I said, I've been in this fandom for so long. Unless someone has new evidence, which is hard, really hard to pull these days, uh, it's not. Um, it, it's not a big. Uh, it doesn't need rehashing if, to me, but to people like having it the way you presented it was really good. I love. I watched your video, and because it's a conversation that happens a lot in this fandom, it's really good to give people all the details so they are prepared to make this debate happen properly. So they, when someone approaches them and says, hey, why do you believe our why don't you do this? They can say, oh, because I, I, I have all this evidence laid out nicely for me. They don't have to kind of try to up the arguments themselves because they can say, well, I've watched In Deep Geek and, and he laid out this evidence really well and they can pick any of the many facts you laid out to support their arguments. And uh, yeah, in this day and age, we all, it's good to for people to be able to be prepared to argue or debate properly. And yeah. uh, so uh, that's why these things need to still be presented, but that doesn't, you know, that's, 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 uh, it doesn't mean that entertaining other theories means you believe in them. It's just a matter of respect. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with that. I think the, the one thing which, uh, and, and actually I will also uh, put my hand up and say uh, on my first read through of the books, I can't remember how many years ago it was now, I didn't pick up on that either. It wasn't a thing that I was particularly looking for. I was just enjoying them as a casual reader and, and uh, I knew there was a mystery there, but I hadn't I hadn't done the, 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 the digging and thinking about it or talking to people um, or even trying to hunt for things on Reddit that allowed me to go to that extra level. So I also didn't pick up on it on the first read through. Um, one, just one thing I think I would, uh, in terms of uh, evidence is probably the wrong word for it, but one thing which struck me a lot when I was working on that video was um, you talk about the, the literary, it needs to work in a literary sense. If there are, if um, John's parents are Ned and anyone, the the question is, well, how would people react in the book? Not how would we react, but how would the characters in the book react? Hmm. And the answer is that absolutely everybody, when you get this reveal, which has been set up in this book as being hugely important, who are John Snow's parents? If, if it turns out that we find out 100% that it is, Ned and Ashara or Willa or Fisherman's Daughter or whoever, then every single character, Tyrion, Cersei, whoever, would go, oh, okay, fair enough. We knew he had a bastard <laughs> child. Anyway. Fine, move on. Uh, it doesn't make any difference to anything. It's exactly what John thought. He might go, oh, so my mother was a wet nurse or a Fisherman's Daughter or a noblewoman. It doesn't change anything for the other characters in the plot. And so George R. R. Martin has built this up as this big mystery. It has to have some purpose, not just, uh, well, we find out that actually uh, John's mother was a twice mentioned woman from Dawn or, or whatever. It doesn't, it, it doesn't work as, as a, as a bit of literature, but um, let's, let's, um, move on to Cassus belly. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat saying in line with R plus L, what does Jamie, uh, the last white cloak, know about R plus L? 
he was at King's Landing when Rhaegar returned before the Trident. Now, this is a fascinating question because we it's mentioned in the books and we get Jamie thinking about it in the books, but it's not expanded on hugely that when Rhaegar returns from the Tower of Joy, he goes to King's Landing and Jamie remembers just before they then he gathers the army together and they head up to the Battle of the Trident. And he has this little conversation. Rhaegar has a conversation with, with Jamie. Um, he doesn't talk in that about um, you know, Leanna or anything like that. So we don't know that he said anything. He probably didn't say anything there. Um, what he was talking about was uh, sort of mutterings about paths not taken and there's going to be some changes after all of this and things like that. So yeah. what Jamie, uh, what he was wanting to talk to Jamie about was a sort of tee him up to the idea that when Rhaegar wins the battle, because Rhaegar was convinced he was going to win, win the battle, one of the many, many things Rhaegar was wrong about. Um, once Rhaegar wins the battle, he was going to come back and he was effectively going to do what he was trying to do beforehand, the, the turning at Harren Hall, which was to get the nobles together and get his father out of power and him into power. That's the implication of it, rather than talking to Jamie about, hey, you'll never guess what happened down at the Tower of Joy, and who I left down there. Uh, so what Jamie will have known is that... Uh, as far as we can tell, is that Lyanna was there with Rhaegar. He will know that the Kingsguard went down there. He will definitely know that Gerald Hightower, who was sent to go and get uh, uh, Rhaegar, did not return, so he'll know he was there as well, but I don't think he will know any of the details about what was happening. Well, is there anything that you've picked up on that Jamie knew above and beyond that kind of basic level? No, I don't think so. I think you covered it really well. There's maybe just a couple other details I would add to maybe round out the picture a little bit more, um, which is that uh, Jamie also explicitly mentions that he was, because he was the new kid in the Kingsguard, that he wasn't privy to uh, a lot of what was going on, uh, partly because Ares didn't trust him, uh, didn't trust his father, and because Rhaegar had his close confidence that had been well developed over a long period of time. And Rhaegar wasn't, a, wasn't the kind of guy that would just trust somebody just out of, you know, just right away. He, he could have earned Rhaegar's trust over time possibly, but obviously there was no overtime. There was no time for overtime to happen. <laughs> and uh, so there might be a few like pieces of information that he knows that he doesn't realize would help us figure out this mystery because overall jamie as a character doesn't know there is a mystery right he know i mean not in terms of john's parentage he he probably doesn't make that connection he may he, he may know that Rhaegar and liana went down well he certainly knows that but anything about a kid or all that stuff it might hit him like a ton of bricks if he just start if, if he's given reason to start thinking about it and noodles it out and is like wait a minute that kid that ned stark ned stark wouldn't have a bad wait a minute you know he might it might be a revelation for him. And since he has his own POV, we might get that. And then he might think about a few other details that as a, us readers would be very interested to hear that he didn't realize were important. So yeah, it's kind of an untapped, it's a good point to, to raise because it's like uh, an untapped source of R plus L equals J info. Like who else has detail? We all know Hal and Reed has a lot of info. We all know Bran can look in the Weirwood net. We know that Willa may still be out there. We know that maybe Ned Dane was told a few things, but uh, and maybe there were some other servants at the Tower of Joy, but Jamie is by far the most important character. Uh, I'm not important, prominent character that might have Arpel Silic with J info, uh, but even if he doesn't know what he knows, you know, because <laughs> he doesn't know why it's yeah. important. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think we we don't know. He, he probably has, like a lot of people there at the time, he, he has the tools and the hints that if he sat down and thought about it, he might well be able to figure it out in a way that the implication is that Littlefinger figured it out. Um, on the show, certainly, is that, that, that that's kind of hinted at, I think. Um, I think Jamie could have done. Um, certainly, everybody was 
slightly confused when Ned arrived back with a child and, and all the rest of it, and it didn't seem very like him. But the fact is that there was a whole load of other stuff going on at the time. Robert Baratheon had just been made king. He had to create a new king's guard. He had to try and um, uh, work out who was on his side, who wasn't on his side, and all the rest of it. And Ned could just quickly move through and onwards. So uh, I, there were other more important things that people were thinking about right then at the time. Um, uh, Hermione Granger of House Gryffindor with 209 SEK. I don't know what SEK are, but thank you very much. Um, if Ned killed Arthur Dane at the Tower of Joy, why don't the Danes at least dislike Ned? Did the Tower of Joy happen like they had us believe? or who killed Arthur? Uh, these are some excellent questions, and I think these are gonna be at the heart of my next video on the series, which is looking at the Tower of Joy, and I think that the, what happened with Arthur Dane is gonna be central to this. So I'm gonna throw it to Aziz first before I spoil bits of my video. Uh, but Aziz, <laughs> what, what's, what's, what's your take on, on Arthur Dane and what happened? Um, clearly, the, the Danes like Ned, and that doesn't tie in with the idea that he mercilessly killed him. Yeah, I think that there's, they must have some understanding of the story of why everything happened the way it did, because for them to forgive Ned or even potentially hold him in high regard it means something happened. And, you know, it, on the surface, well, he behaved honorably, I guess. He brought back Dawn, which he didn't have to do that, I suppose. So maybe they were thankful for that, but that's not enough to forgive him for killing Rhaegar or killing Arthur Dane. Um, of course, Ned didn't probably kill Arthur Dane. It was probably Howland Reed, but I don't know if that would, I don't know if they see that differently because it was his group of people that killed Arthur. So that's not, that's probably a technicality that doesn't change their, their feelings. But, um, he must have done something to win their win their uh, to to be seen in a positive light. It's hard to predict what it was. Um, I think they probably just understood. Uh, they maybe they forgive him for uh, being put in an impossible situation, or maybe they uh, disagreed with their own uh, their own kin's take. Maybe they thought that. Uh, he was wrong to do what he did. You know, Arthur should not have been guarding this strange kid that they don't know who he is, <laughs> you know? Uh, so it, I don't know. I don't have a, I guess that none of these, none of these answers I've, I've just rattled off sound super convincing. So it's, um, it's one of those things that I'm really hoping to uh, get more info on. And it's one of those things that Howland Reed is Chekhov's Reed <laughs> waiting to tell us. <laughs> This info, yeah. uh, Chekhov's uh, Frogman, you know. <laughs> yeah. So what do you, I, I want to hear what you have to say about it, though. Well, I I mean, I'm now immediately starting to think, oh, actually, maybe I need to make this two videos. One is <laughs> what happened at the Tower of Joy, and one is why does House Dane like Ned so much? Because it is, it's uh, one of the two... Um, things that have most vexed me when I'm trying to figure out what happened at the Tower of Joy. The other, incidentally, is uh, why didn't Ned take the bones of his bannerman back up north? That's the other one that's been vexing me. Um, uh, but in terms of uh, Arthur Dane, um, I think we can be reasonably clear that Ned did not kill him in cold blood in some way. Um, that would not be that would not lead to him being held in high regard. I think him being held in high regard is not just to do with what happened with Arthur, but it's also to do with what happened with Ashara. Mm. Um, so it's like looking at things in the round of what happened there at the time. Um, I think you're right. I think that it's entirely likely Ned did not kill Arthur Dane. I also don't think that Howland did. It, that's just oh. my gut instinct. I don't. I, okay. I th they they did it on the show because I think that was the easy way of showing it. The, in the books, the language is quite uncertain. It says Ned 
says, uh, Arthur Dane was the finest swordsman I ever saw. Clear implication that they fought. He would have killed me but for Howland Reed. Yeah. And that does not mean that Howland Reed, who all the evidence we have is probably not a great fighter, that does not mean that Howland Reed killed Arthur Dane and saved Ned's life. That means that he did something that meant that Arthur didn't kill him. That's that's my interpretation of it. So that's where I'm that's as far as I'm spoiling it at the moment because I haven't got to a final conclusion on it yet. But that's that's where I'm at, is I don't think necessarily either of them killed Arthur Dane. Um, I hope that one answers that. Uh, it's still slightly vague, and I, it's the reason why I'm still being slightly vague is that I haven't fully nailed down what I think happened, but I'm almost there now. Um, and answers on a postcard about why uh, Ned didn't take those bodies uh, or the, the the bones of his bannerman back up north. Um, actually, I will. I'm, I'm going to indulge myself on this one. Uh, Aziz, you can answer this one for me. Why didn't he? Why didn't he what? Take take the bones of his bannerman back up north. Probably just logistics. Um, you know how how do you carry all those bodies? It was just him and a couple people. Most of the people he was with were killed. I don't know how you haul all that back up there. <laughs> you know, like this is a different bag marked with. Okay, this bag is Arthur's bones. This bag is uh, <laughs> is uh, uh, the I'm forgetting all the names of his companions. Um, all these other guys that were with him, the Glover, Ethan Glover was the, yeah, Ethan Glover was one of them. And, uh, the, 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 the other, um, member of house Cassell, uh, Martin Cassell, I guess was another one. Yeah. I, I don't, I'm not sure how he would have done that. It's hard to bring all those bones back. Maybe it's, it might just be that simple. Like you have to strip the flesh off of the bones to be able to carry them as just bones. If you don't do that, then you're carrying bodies and he obviously yeah. can't just haul all those bodies up there. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like it might just be that simple logistics. Like he couldn't bring all those bodies home. Um, although maybe, and if he's not going to bring you know, he doesn't want to play favorites. If he just brings say Barbary Dustin's husband back and not the other ones, well, that's kind of an insult to the rest. So if he just leaves all of them, it's like, well, I, I had to bury them all down there. I don't know. It's, it seems like it would be difficult to bring all those bodies up there. <laughs> I think that's probably a fair answer. I mean, not a sexy I, I, answer, but yeah, it's still it's not a, it's not a sexy answer. I think it's probably a fair <laughs> answer. I mean, I, I think my instinct is that there will have been some people in King's Landing that he could have sent back to do it. Um, uh, my working assumption is that he got a boat from Starfall around to King's Landing, stopped in there, made his excuses to Robert, then headed back up north from there. His army was still knocking around the south in Storm's End. I'm sure some people have gone back up there. So um, it still feels a bit odd to me that he didn't try and get someone to do something with it, given that he knew what an insult it would be not to bring the stuff that their bodies up. Given, yeah, he did actually owe them quite a biggie as <laughs> well. Those people <laughs> who did their lives for him. Um, uh but yeah anyway if, if anyone's got a better answer um then then feel free we're, we're the, aziz you may well be right having the the boring answer but if there's a sexy <laughs> more interesting one then i'm happy to hear it uh donna daly thank you so much for the super chat why didn't ned improve his marriage by telling catlin the truth i get it at first but he must have trusted her eventually i think this is a a really good question but i think that we just have to go with the solid answer that he promised to tell no one. And that included Catelyn, who he, uh, you're right to start with, he didn't know her very well, but he carried this and within him so that he could tell them. As far as he knew, Catelyn could at some point get captured and uh, she, uh, it was a, that there were revolutions literally every few years around that time. Um, uh, so the, the chances were possible that she might get captured by somebody and she might reveal some stuff, even if he trusted her completely herself. Um, but I think it just boils down to he promised that he would tell no one, and he stuck by that because he was a man of his word. Um, he, he thinks about the promises that he made and the price he had to pay 
And that makes sense to me that the price he had to pay was um, a sometimes acrimonious marriage. Um, that that was uh, one of the prices he had to pay for it. Uh, Aziz, did you have any other thoughts on that, why he didn't trust her? No, I think you nailed it. I think that he is the kind of man that believes in absolutes and he made that promise. That's it. He's keeping it, <laughs> especially <laughs> under the circumstances. You know, it reminds him of his it's a promise made to his dying sister. He does not want to betray that because it was such an emotional moment, um, emotional experience that. Uh, yeah, I do think there's a chance he would have maybe told her once the danger had passed. Like, let's say a Song of Ice and Fire is a completely different story and Robert dies uh, one day and j then there's no, you know, and John is at the Night's Watch. And men, maybe Ned could tell Catelyn, hey, by the way, now that the, you know, now you see why I didn't tell you? Because, you know, it was, it was, it, I was worried that someone would find out, but now it won't matter. So maybe he would have told her later in life when, when the danger was passed. But I'm skeptical about that even because, yeah, he's just a, a he kept his promise. I think that's the thing. I think you're right. It just comes down to that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, th I think you might be right, though, that, so the we often think about um Leanna saying promise me Ned as if they it was just one promise. Yeah. Ned thinks about promises, mm -hmm. not just a promise. Yeah, the and promise so, may not have been never tell. The promise was protect him. And if she yeah. and if he feels that it's safe to now reveal his identity because it's no longer he's no longer a threat, then then that wouldn't be breaking a promise. Yeah, exactly. And another promise might have been when he's grown up, tell him who his parents were. Or something Ooh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good call. Um, because he does, Ned also feels tortured about broken promises, which, mm. is, which is quite intriguing. Now, there there was one that I kind of stumbled across when he, he promised to look after uh, or care for Barra, one of Robert Baratheon's children, mm. um, uh, bastard children. He broke that promise because he couldn't do anything about it because he uh, effectively got captured pretty much straight away afterwards. But um, I don't think it was just that. I think that it's, there's a fair chance that, as we saw on the show when he's there and he's saying to John, you know, I will tell you about your mother when I next see you. And in the books, we also get Benjamin who says similar things when he ranges off up north and he says, yeah, when I come back and once after you've sworn... Uh, your Night's Watch oath, then I will tell you, um, then we'll talk, he says. <laughs> so it, yeah. uh, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me if one of the promises was to tell him once it was safe or something along those lines. Um, and that fits in with Cat because once John knew, then Cat could also know is, is my take on that one. And that's also that would also explain a bit of why he felt a little bit of relief at the idea that he was going to be allowed to take the black when he yeah. was down um, because he was like, oh, well, I can tell John now. He at that he probably thought early before he was given that reprieve, he probably thought that was it for him, and uh, he would never get to tell John, which would mean he wasn't able to keep that promise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Good call. Good call. Yeah. So uh, Dakota Stanton, thank you so much, $20. That's very kind. Um, I think Ned wouldn't have allowed the dishonor of lying about uh, about uh, the bodies, I assume this is. And I think uh, Barbary Dustin was pissed because he brought back uh, brought Dawn back, the sword back to Starfall, but not William. Uh, also, she probably thinks John is a show, so, so, so probably thought favoritism of Southerners. Yeah, so so Barbara Dustin is the character whose eyes we see this um, problem of Ned not bringing the bodies back through because she holds it against Ned the fact that he he didn't bring the the, the body back uh, of it was it William Dustin wasn't it um, and uh, so. Um, she bears the grudge against Ned even after he has died, and uh, she's quite a character. Um, but uh, it's it makes no sense in terms of the so Ned's yes he took down took uh, the sword dawn to Starfall and he took Lyanna's bones all the way up to the north. Uh, I I I still find it quite odd that he didn't get anyone to go and collect those bodies, and I think that there is a 
I, I've got a a thought up here somewhere that there's a reason why he didn't, and he also he didn't bury them at the Tower of Joy, incidentally. So a small detail, he met, he buried them on a ridge nearby. Now that it's the kind of thing which could just be a random phrase, but to me, if you are building cairns with stones that you've got from a, a demolished tower, you wouldn't haul them all the way up to the top of a ridge nearby. A lot of extra it. effort, yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> and I who think, else is with him doing all this, right? This well, can't be a one-man job. How Howland and quite a few horses, as far as I can tell. But it's yeah. just like uh it seems like a lot of extra effort that so for me he was not uh and you know this again i'm always spoiling my videos uh <laughs> they're, they're, he is that he is hiding the bodies mm. he is not uh deliberately trying to snuff people that's just what the evidence there seems that's to hint to me i guess the counter argument there is cairns are not very hidden if you're going to hide someone's body you you put them in the ground but maybe they just maybe that just wasn't physically possible maybe the ground was too solid or something i don't know yeah. uh by the way um speaking of fire and blood which i mentioned much earlier and how it, it's added so much it's, it's added things to this discussion too as we see in fire and blood there's sort of a proto tower of joy incident with jaharis and alisand and a showdown and george is very very careful to point out multiple times that there were more people at this incident than the histories make out, which is to me is a slam dunk. George is telling us there were more people at the Tower of Joy than Ned's memories tell you. Uh, it's it's a common thing for lords to just kind of ignore the serving men and the squires yeah. and just and the maesters do the same thing. The idea that those seven Ned and the seven companions didn't have like a squire or another person with them is possible. But the idea that there weren't other people in the Tower of Joy besides the Kingsguard is ridiculous, right? I mean, and the show doesn't, even the show has that. They show other people there, you know, taking care of Liana. There's no way the Kingsguard are doing that. So there were other people there. Um, and that's what George was telling us. And that is, is, is making very clear in that uh, section of Fire and Blood that, remember, <laughs> you know, there's always, there's other people there. There's always like servants and, and unmentioned guards and things like that. So there's more witnesses. Yeah, I think I think you're completely right. I think that there's and that's a really good call across to the the sort of the Jaharis Alasin kind of link in Fire and Blood. Um, yeah, there definitely I'm sure were more people there at the Tower of Joy. Um, I, I do believe it was just the people named for Ned and Co. Um, uh, I think that um, what's his name. Glover, uh, Ethan Glover was a squire, so I think that he was squiring. That was his role, effectively. Um, so yeah, I, he was I, Brandon uh, Squire, wasn't he? He was, yeah. Which um, to me, that's that's a bit of a, a, a fog because if he was Brandon Squire, he may no longer be a squire, but not much time had passed. So, like, why would they, you know, why would they promote him just because he's he wasn't killed by the Mad King? I mean, well, I mean, he <laughs> so, was. Yeah, it's a. So his story was that he was there with he was Brandon Squire. He went down to this is the, one of these things that a lot of a detail again in, in this that I picked up when we're going through it that perhaps many people don't know. So there were half a dozen people who went with Brandon down yeah. to uh, confront Rhaegar. They thought um, the Mad King locked them all up, then summoned their fathers, and all the fathers came down except for. Um, uh, Ethan Glover's father, who was, of course, up in Deepwood Mott. It would have taken months for him to come down. So that's just a matter of logistics why he didn't come down, I'm pretty sure. Um, and he survived because uh, he was stayed down in the black cells because what seemed to be happening was that um, Aerys was trying, trying the, 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 the sons with their fathers. And we saw that with Rickard and Brandon, and that seemed to have happened with the other ones as well. And so he was just waiting for the father so that he could try them together. But that never happened. So he just sort of like stayed in uh, in the cells for you know, a year, maybe even more, until it would appear um, Ned Stark found him there after he'd gone down to King's Landing, after the sack of King's Landing, and took him with him. And he was one of the people who he took on from Storm's End to the Tower of Joy. So it's almost like he's picking the people that he that were already involved in this somehow, the people he felt he could trust 
not necessarily the people who are the best fighters because he was was a squire and then got locked up in the black cells for a year and then uh, just traveled a little bit straight afterwards. Yeah, he was the one was, guy that didn't get killed and then he gets exactly. down to the Tower of Joy and gets yeah. killed. Like, oh. <laughs> but he's, he was a squire who had no training for a year in terms of his combat readiness. He was not going to be a good fighter. So I think he would still have been a squire. That was a long way around for me to saying I think he was still acting as a squire. Mm. Um, uh, we're, we're digressing slightly. But Linda Prasuta, thank you. So again, a, love, a wonderful super chat. Uh, that's, that's very kind. Is the ink really dry? Should we really totally trust Bloodraven? Um, I think this is very conceptual question. I did a uh, I've, I've got an occasional series of videos that I do. And in fact, Aziz, I must have you on for this sometime, that I have right. uh, some creators on, or a, a creator at a time, and I just say, you know, what's your favorite theory? And it's just, mm. as long as it's not tinfoil, uh, it's something that we can sort of discuss, um, uh, and we just sort of like talk through it, because I love having different ideas on the channel. So we've had a few different ones we had, so Smokescreen was talking about the Isle of Faces burning. Um, had uh, Grey came on, we was talking about whether Euron might be the Valonqar. Uh, I had uh, Gemma from Secrets of the Citadel uh, on, and she was talking about this uh, the, the, sort of the time travel, brand time travel uh, thing. Not because she particularly supported it, but she wanted to talk about it as this idea of... Um, Bran going back in time as part of the sort of the, the the final solution of what's going to be happening, and in that we came to the idea that uh, that I think is I think I still stand by that uh, the world of ice and fire seems to operate on a closed time loop basis. Things that have happened have always happened. People can express this a lot better than I can in the chat, I'm sure. But things that have happened always were going to happen because of things that, that may happen in the future. So, for example, you get the... Um, uh, you saw on the show when Ned at the Tower of Joy turns around when Bran shouts out. Um, and the logic there is that Ned always turned round. He didn't see Bran, but he always turned round. So Bran shouting actually just closed that time loop. That was just a thing which always happened. We get the same kind of things happening in uh, in the books where Ned, uh, when he's in Winterfell, he hears Bran calling out to him uh, and he says, who's there? Um, and that always happened because Ned always experience that thing and in a slightly more complicated way that was what was happening with hodor because hodor always was going to hold the door that was mm -hmm. the whole point about what was happening and so that was a closed time loop that happened the moment that bran went back it's not that they created a new time stream or anything like that we're not talking lots of different parallel universes of things happening if somebody goes back in time they might try and change something, but actually the thing that they change has already happened in their future. So close time loop, which brings Linda back to your question, is the ink really dry? Should we totally trust Bloodraven? I think that this is true to the extent when he says the ink is dry in that everything that uh, has happened has happened already. Uh, in terms of will happen has happened already will have happened i think that's the, 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 the way of saying it will have happened so um is the ink dry well yes i think that's a slightly re rhetorical flourish on the, on the way that i call it as a closed time loop um but as these do you have any kind of takes on this it's, it was, it's heading slightly theoretical here but in terms of how how time works can you change the past in Game of Thrones. I think George doesn't like that as a plot line. Like he's been on kind of in interviews from from talking about time travel. He isn't a fan of that. Uh, so I don't think there's going to be much of it. I think very minor uh, affecting of the past at most. Um, I don't think uh, he wants to get too deep into the weeds with time travel because it's such a tricky plot. Uh, element that's hard to do right. It's it's so 
it's badly handled by so many different movies and shows and books that have tried to do it. And I think George is aware is is aware of that. It's just too uh, it's just too clunky and too hard to do right. It leaves too many questions and it leaves people confused. So I think he's going to do it to a very bare minimum or not at all. And uh, to the other part of the question, I think Blood Raven is 100 percent to be trusted. I don't. I think <laughs> he's I mean, during his life, the guy just did nothing but fight for the realm. He never enriched himself. He never did anything to, you know, advance his own personal uh, position, you know, and uh, he, he did nothing obvious anyway. So um, he's just doing the same thing he did in life. Uh, doesn't care about what people think of him, but he does the right thing. Uh, within reason, you know, he's not, he's not perfect. Uh, I don't agree yeah. with all of the way he's, his policies and everything he did. There's plenty of criticisms for him, but the idea that he's uh, a bad guy. Um, no, definitely not. I'm, I'm very confident in that one. Yes. And I not agree. Like, like R plus L equals J confident, but pretty, <laughs> but pretty <good. laughs> I agree. Uh, my only little asterisk on that would be he is, uh, he can be trusted to the extent that Melisandre can be trusted in that she does, she is doing what she thinks is right. She's pursuing it. Mm -hmm. And she is willing to do things that some people might think are wrong or evil or bad in order to get to what she thinks is the greater good. Oh, Blood yeah. Raven is the exact same. He is willing to do things that people don't like, think he's a, are evil, because he is trying to achieve what he considers to be a greater good. I think that of the two, um, although they might both be claiming to be sort of trying to save humanity, I think that Blood Raven's slightly closer to the truth in what it is that needs to be done, if that makes yeah. sense. I totally agree with that caveat, that that trusting him doesn't mean that he has your best interests at heart. I mean, if he he is definitely an ends justified and means kind of guy. So he'll, you're right, he'll do any, if it means saving humanity, he'll do anything. If it means grinding Jojen into paste and feeding it to Bran, he won't bat an eye at that. Uh, so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, morally, thank you. That's an incredibly generous super chat. Um, uh, again, thank you. Saying for Blood Raven, can't wait for your video to connect the dots. Uh, yeah, that's that's coming um, slightly as say at the end of my uh, epic series about uh, Robert's Rebellion and so on. Um, uh, Maza Monty, uh, thank you for your super chat. Could it be that Arthur with Dawn and the could that be Arthur with Dawn and the Golden Company in the trailer? Um, Harry Strickland, they struck a deal at the tower. I don't think so. Um, I think that in the trailer, this is the Golden Company. I think it is Harry Strickland. I don't think it's going to be all the background about Harry Strickland. Um, he was, and I know there was a lot of speculation about this, he was um, prominently displaying a rather fine-looking sword. And I know people have queried whether that's... Um, Blackfire, the sword, it didn't look like the sword Dawn, um, it has to be said. Um, I know people have speculated it might be Blackfire. I think that if it is there, they're not going to make a thing of it because they've not really talked about Blackfire. And as we've already mentioned, they've completely taken out the whole Blackfire plot from the yeah. TV show. So I don't think it's, it's they're going to make a deal of it. Blackfire the sword hasn't even been mentioned in the books. People don't, I think a lot of people don't even realize that. Neither Blackfire nor Dark Sister is mentioned in the main five novels. They're only mentioned in the extended material. So yeah, I'm with you there. I don't think Blackfire is going to be a thing in the show at all. It's it's it might only barely be a thing in the books. I think it's going to be a thing in the books, but it's not. Yeah. Uh, the fact that it hasn't even been mentioned yet is pretty huge. <laughs> yeah, I think it was it was nearly mentioned um that George R. R. Martin, when he was doing uh, I think it was one of a, a chapter, Tyrion chapter for Dance with Dragons, a pre-read. Oh, that Shrouded uh, Lord chapter? Yeah, I think so, when he was talking with, or Illyrio was Oh, there, oh no, the early you know, version of the second Illyrio chapter. Yes. Yeah, where he mentioned and sword, yeah. But exactly. he didn't, in that chapter, it doesn't say Blackfire, it just says sword. Yes, but, and, and I mean, I think that that probably was a reference to Blackfire, and I suspect... Oh, yeah. That That's this is going to be one of the re one of the things that Fagon Aegon is going to have to try and show his birthright in some way is that he's going to be carrying Blackfire. Uh, but I agree with that, yeah, hundred percent. That's that's. Yeah. I think that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, let's go back to some questions from patrons. Um, 
Uh, James Sidney with a hypothetical question saying, how would the plan have changed if Liana had lived? Um, did the plan still go forward? Ned claiming John, bringing it to Winterfell. Liana stays with Robert, question mark. I think Liana in no scenario would have stayed with Robert, would have gone to Robert. I think that she made a decision that she did not wish to be with Robert Baratheon, and I think she would have stuck with that if she stayed alive. So I think that having to protect baby John would have still been the case. Uh, and incidentally, this is something we we often forget. When Ned was going to the Tower of Joy, he was not going there thinking, oh, I'm going to have to do, deal with a dead Lyanna and, and a baby and all the rest of it. He didn't know. He just thought he was going there for Lyanna. Uh, he might have thought maybe there's going to be a baby because, you know, if they'd been together that long, it's a possibility. But he was not thinking that. He was thinking about going for Lyanna. So um, the the whole plan with John was probably concocted almost on the spot with with a few other people. Um, so I don't think Lyanna goes back to Robert. I think that she would have stayed with, kept her baby, but I think they probably would have got her in hiding somewhere is my best guess. It's all theoretical but um, I, I don't see there's any way she's going back to Robert Baratheon. And then what if John had more Targaryen features? Would he have stayed at Starfall and passed as a Dane? I think that's a fascinating question. I think there's a possibility that they might um, they might have gone with the uh, Ned and Ashara thing and said that, yes, this is Ashara's child um, uh, and, and uh, gone with that as, a, as an idea. But it's, again, it's just... Uh, Theoretically, um, what 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 do you think on any of those theoreticals? What if Leanna had lived or John hadn't looked Starkish? What what do you think might have happened? Well, hmm, that's a tough one. I, I sometimes struggle with the what ifs because there's just so many moving parts, and I get lost in the <laughs> in all the possibilities. <laughs> um, hmm. Well, I don't. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. That's really tough. I think that uh, with with John as a gosh, I don't know. You just don't. You'd have a totally different story, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's probably an unfair question. It's. Um, I think I think that the, the the point is that there are some things that we know and would be constraining factors, but exactly what plan they would come up with, we can't tell. I think we know that Liana had decided she's not going to be with Robert. I think that there's almost no chance that she would have allowed, if she'd been alive, she'd have allowed her own child to be taken away from her. I don't think that was going to happen. I think that they would definitely, therefore, still need to be in hiding. Exactly how they yeah. go about doing that, I don't know. Ned would certainly take his sister's side over Robert, 100%. That's pretty yeah. easy, I think. Uh, it would be tough for him, but it would also be... The choice would be hard, but also the which choice he would make is easy. Uh, but yeah, man, that's tough. I guess maybe they'd have to flee. Maybe they would have to just try to close up the north and just hope that they could fight off any invasions if they wanted to do it the like hardcore way. But ah, yeah, really hard to tell. Really hard to say. Yeah. Uh, Bonds has a theory. Could the fisherman's daughter, this is the, uh, the rumor that we hear uh, sort of via Davos um, and Godric Borrell and in the sisters, um, uh, could that be Ashara and pregnant uh, with whoever dishonoured her at Harrenhal? She then loses the baby, as according to Barristan. He then meets Ned in King's Landing and journeys with Ned to Starfall via the Tower of Joy. And they produce a baby during this time. This baby would be nine months younger than Jon Snow and is Danny. Um, I personally think not. Um, I think that there a lot of what I said in my video about the, the reasoning why it's not um, uh, Ashara up there. I mean, it, for me, it also makes no logistical sense for Ashara to be anywhere near the sisters. Even if you have this idea that Ashara and Ned had got some kind of um, love affair going on, why on earth would he say, hey, why don't you meet me in the Vale? when getting to where he was, he didn't know exactly where he was heading. He was going across the mountains, a very treacherous, just after a bad winter with all the hill clans. I see absolutely no reason why he would have said, meet me there. Uh, so that, that makes no sense to me. Um, uh, I think with Ashara, George R. R. Martin said she wasn't 
um, nailed to the floor in Starfall. My instinct with her, I've got nothing to back this up other than what sounds sensible, is that she seems to she seems to have been with the gang at Dragonstone, Rhaegar and Elia and um, uh, Arthur Dane and people like that. And if they were heading off, if Rhaegar was heading off to pick up Lyanna, as appears to have been the plan, I know what I would have done in that situation is not just go there with a bunch of guys in armour to pick up this random woman. You'd have a woman along with you as well who perhaps knew already Lyanna, and that is Ashara Dane. So it makes sense to me that Ashara Dane was part of that group of people who went to collect Lyanna. That's, as I say, no evidence other than for that other than it makes sense to me. Uh, it what, does what make some sense, yeah. Hmm. That does make sense. I don't know, you know, if uh, if Liana was already like had already fallen for Rhaegar, that might not be necessary. She might have just been, you know, because she's kind of aggressive, kind of bold personality. But it makes sense that they would want to potentially want to take that precaution because uh, they may not all know that. They may not be aware that she would just go along with it. So they would want to, yeah. yeah, have to take, you know, have backup, <laughs> a backup plan or to have, to make sure it goes right. Take no chances. And um, Ashara having, you know, being the kind of person she is, we don't really know what kind of person she is, but it seems like she was kind of a gentle, um, maybe uh, the right kind of person for, to make that kind of connection. Someone who's soft-spoken or, or maybe a good um, mediator type. I know that's making some assumptions about what kind of person she was, but still, but but she's at least the right age to be relatively close to Liana and uh, all that. So, and especially if she had had, if Liana had heard her name, if Ned had mentioned, you know, her and said, you know, I know this person, she's cool. <laughs> so yeah. Liana may have heard about Ashara a little bit ahead of time and had, a, you know, a, was positively predisposed towards her. Well, I think there's I think there's every chance that they met at Harrenhal, those two. This is yes. my yeah. we, we, we we don't know, but certainly Brandon talked to Ashara, Ned danced with Ashara. Uh there were rumors that Ashara was in Ned's tent, which he shared with Howland Reed. I've got a whole other theory about that one. Um uh but Leanna was in that group. So it makes absolute sense to me that they met at the very least there. Um, uh, so I don't think they would have been strangers. Um, but while we're on Ashara, uh, Cherim Miller uh, on Patreon says, I know some people think Ned and Ashara are John's parents. I don't. Do you think they might have been fake Aegon's parents? If so, could fake Aegon be the sword of the morning? Or is that too tinfoil? Um, I... I don't think so myself. Um, I think that um, Ned and Ashara were never an item, is my feel on this. I see no evidence that they were. Um, the I, I think you always have to say, well, who the other characters around it, is there anyone actually who gives the impression that they thought that was the case, who was actually there? Barrist and Selmy, we know, had a huge crush on Ashara Dane, was keeping a very close eye on what was going on with her. Uh, he thinks that she was dishonoured by somebody, which is probably his rather prudish way of saying that she slept with somebody at Harren Hall. Um, and yet he seems to think Ned is an incredibly honourable person. So every hint there is that Ned was not the person that Ashara slept with at Aaron Hall. Um, then we get Robert Baratheon, who doesn't guess at all the idea that Ashara might be an item with Ned, because when he's trying to guess who it was who Ned um, uh, slept with uh, to or was John's mother, then he he's struggling to remember this Willa person, but the, the thought never occurs to him that it might be 
Ashara. And remember, they were best friends. They were there at Harrenhal together. They travelled from Harrenhal all the way back to the Eyrie together. They were in the Eyrie all the time until the, the outbreak of war. During that period of time, which is when this alleged romance happened between Ned and Ashara, Robert Baratheon didn't get any whiff of it. And this was not something Ned had to keep a secret in any way, shape or form before the war. There was absolutely no reason. It, actually, it was a very good match. It would have worked really well. It was probably the right level for him in terms of in these kind of social hierarchies. He was the second son of a first tier lord. She was the, the daughter of a, a second tier lord, but a very ancient and influential one. So it, that would have been a good one for building these alliances that that um, Rickard Stark was trying to do at the time. So there is no sense to me behind and no hint that they were actually an item um, producing any children. But Aziz, do you have any uh, additional bits of, of, of thought on Ned and Ashar and what they're, even if you don't think they're John's parents, what do you think that they're relationship work was as it were yeah i do agree that i don't think they had much of a relationship or or any relationship i do think that you know he he did want to try to dance with her i think that was true i think he was probably a little bit into her but um uh other than that yeah he's not that kind of guy you know he's not the kind of like like his brother where he just pursues this woman and given that we're told he was too shy to ask her to dance there's no way he like seduced her <laughs> he was too shy that he needed someone else to ask her to dance there's no way he you know pushed uh sleeping with her the only thing i can think of there is that she's dornish you know maybe she was sexually aggressive and she you know wanted you know she pushed the issue but that doesn't seem like her personality even though it's possible there's no evidence of that uh so it's just a theory kind of built on uh, mostly pure guesswork uh, so I agree that there's not a whole lot of evidence between that they had any sort of deep relationship, maybe more of a, you know, hey, you're cool, uh, you, you know, <laughs> like, a, <laughs> like teenagers at a, at a, at a prom, you know, <laughs> just yeah. making eyes at each other. Um, but I do want to throw out something. You mentioned the Southern ambitions, um, and I do want to throw out a, since we were talking about Blood Raven, I want to mention something that I thought was cool. I have we have a Blood Raven video on our way on the way as well. A third one. The first two were covering his political life, his life as a before he became a tree. Uh, <laughs> so this during his time as Lord Commander, he was uh, on the wall at um, the same time that uh, either Edwile or Rickard would have been Lord of, of Winterfell. And it's not unusual for the Lord of Winterfell to have conversations with the Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. So Blood, Blood Raven, it's uh, if you want to get a little tinfoily, Blood Raven could have been the one to suggest the the Southern ambitions in the first place, or at least encouraged him. Mm. Yeah, that's a good thought. I'd not really made that connection uh, across to Winterfell from there, but uh, yeah, you're right. It, that they will at least have, have been in contact with each other. because Yeah, he was, he was Lord Commander for 13 years. There's no yeah. way the Night's Watch Lord Commander doesn't at least talk to the Lord of Winterfell a couple of times, if not more. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Targaryen on, um, uh, you know, was there with him, Maester Aemon. So that's all sorts of interesting conversations could have gone down between those guys. <laughs> um, got a question from Maura Lee about what evidence might uh, persuade John about we we kind of touched on this earlier, um, but will it will Bran um, will Bran be able to show John? Uh, the past about the Tower of Joy scene, or is it going to be some evidence from Sam, or is there something that Ned hid in the crypts um, that might sort of hint to, or, or be the evidence there? Do you, it's quite a common theory. Do you subscribe to this idea that Ned put something in, you know, no. hidden there in <laughs> Liana's crypt tomb or something? Was that a no? That was a quick no. Yeah, I really, I'm really, i really against this idea. It's, it's been a persistent theory for a long time, but I think it's just, it goes very diametrically opposed to the idea that Ned was going to do everything he could to keep the secret safe. Uh, if for the clue to mean anything, John has to have some idea what it is. And if John can figure it out, then anyone can figure it out. And that's just too, that's a loose end. John, and uh, Ned, also Ned did not expect himself to die, especially such an early age. So I don't see what the, 
Yeah, I, I think that's just people taking something figurative and making it literal, which is that this this truth of his heritage is down there in the crypts, not literal proof of it. <laughs> you yeah. know, not some, some document or a cloak or a or a, a harp. Um, those would get those would be a dead giveaway to other people, I think, and it wouldn't necessarily be a giveaway to, to John. He doesn't know like what. Imagine John finding a harp down there. That wouldn't do anything. John would not know what that means. The readers would, all, us readers would instantly know what that means. We'd be like, oh, a harp, holy crap, that's Rhaegar's harp. But John's like, what is this harp doing here? Yeah, I <laughs> mean, I, I, unless there's a, is the, a letter from, from Leanna saying, oh, uh, dear John, now you're all grown up. Is this, <laughs> you know, I mean, something, I don't know. It, 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 it's, uh, I, I agree with you. The, the, it's a symbolic thing wouldn't prove it. I think uh, more of what I would say was that if you look back a little bit earlier in the video, I think we covered a lot of this one. I think on the show, it's it's entirely likely that Bran may give him some kind of flashback thing. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that was a, a good way of showing it. Um, but some combination of, of Sam uh, having the proof that... Uh, we're talking just show at the moment, but Sam having the proof that Rhaegar and Lyanna were married, uh, and then Bran having some kind of proof that they had a child, um, and that Ned took the child. Um, that would that would do it to persuade him, I suspect. Yeah. If we recall to earlier in the episode, we discussed the idea that that um, we don't know how it's going to go in the show, but in the books, that Bran has already gone into John's dreams and showed him something. He already did. And in fact, it was John's awakening as a skin changer. John's first, I think it's Clash of Kings, John 7. Um, he has his first, he goes into Ghost and, and talks directly to Bran, where he's like, see, you know what? I opened my third eye. It didn't, you know, it, it, it's, um, I like it down here in the dark, blah, blah, blah. It's that kind of cute but creepy dream that, uh, and it's, it's Bran talking directly to John. So I think it's, I think it's been established this is possible. Yeah. Uh, that, and he can get into someone's head and give them a vision. Yeah, um, I was um, having visions they were put put by there by brand. So yeah, it's, it's already happening. Yeah. Uh, Sin the conductor, thank you for your super chat. Despite being the heir, will the lords refuse John? I think this is um, the lords broadly in terms of refuse him being the king, refuse to recognize that he is um, uh, the. The rightful Targaryen heir. Um, I think so. On the show, I think this is entirely possible. I think there's one thing convincing John of who he is. I think it's another convincing other people. Um, but that, and on the show, it's complicated, obviously by Danny, um, uh, but also by the fact that there is all somebody else already sitting on the Iron Throne in Cersei in the books. It's going to get, uh, I am reasonably certain, it's going to turn into what we saw again and again and again in Fire and Blood is a good old-fashioned succession crisis within the Targaryens, is that there are three people who each have a claim you could, but it's suspect in some way, is that, yes, John theoretically might be first in line, but, but, um, uh, but then... If Fagon or Aegon actually is who they say they are, then uh, they're actually further, uh, even higher up in the, the, the line of succession, theoretically, um, unless that marriage was annulled. But then what, does Danny come into this? But oh uh, yes, she does. But then what if uh, that, that a lot of that depend, depends on where John is and what at the situation was there? Would did Rhaegar and Lyanna actually marry or is he just a bastard? So there's a lot of different moving parts and complications there in terms of who is where in terms of the Targaryens on in the books it's also quite complicated in the show so i think that there is not in in any way in any of these things going to be a universal ah yes john now we realize you're the king everybody's going to follow you i don't think that's how it's going to work i agree claims are only as strong as the people enforcing them and uh if john doesn't have people pushing his claim then it, it, his claim is almost irrelevant but i mean i don't think that's how it'll go but just as a point about how claims work so, you know that's a it's a debate that happens in the fandom like whose claim comes first 
which is fun to debate, but but we always have to have that caveat. It's like, well, your claim coming first doesn't mean that you're actually first. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, there's the legal claim, and then there's the armies, <laughs> the swords that are backing all that up. So yeah, that's that's tricky. Um, okay, guys, we're we're starting to get a little bit late over here in the UK, so I'm going to give it ten or fifteen more minutes. I've got about three more questions from my patrons. Uh, but this is your cue. If you've got any more questions uh, to drop into the chat, uh, now is the time to do it. Um, we've been talking a bit about Blood Raven because he's excellent. And this picks up on this frown pouch says, John and, of course, Danny have a healthy amount of Blackwood blood. Do you think this or Raven Tree Hall will have any more part to play other than Blood Raven? So do you, um, House Blackwood, do you think it's going? they're going to be important or is it just a historical matter of interest that there's this blackwood blood within the targaryens well i think it's uh this is a topic that we specifically tackled in our most recent blood raven episode that's not out yet um because we dove into the meta of why george chose blackwood for his other half for blood raven why is he we understand why he was half targaryen but why blackwood and i think it's because he didn't want he wanted someone who had the fire and ice blood he wanted to have he wanted him to have a targaryen house he wanted him to have an old god's worshiping house at the other side but he didn't want him to be a northerner because if he's a northerner it's uh it creates all these other complications it makes some of this a little too straightforward and um it also means he would have uh more connection to the north and it's more important for him to be a southerner for his arc leading up to him learning about the old gods and learning about all the stuff and that being the second half of his life uh so I think that it's it's I think that's why George created House Blackwood just to to do this. And I think there's some clues that George didn't think this through all the way uh, in Catelyn's first or second chapter. She thinks about how all the werewoods are gone in the south, which as we see later is very much not true. Yeah. Catelyn is very wrong about that. And so wrong that it's almost you almost have to think of it as a mistake, even though it's just her perspective. And so you can always say, oh, Catelyn's wrong. But there's a there's a werewood at River Run where she grew up. She can't not be aware of that one. Uh, and there's one at pretty much all the big castles. There's one at there's one at um, Storm's End. There's one at, at uh, Casterly Rock. There's that one Brienne just finds near the Whispers there with uh, Cra Dick Crab and all them. So uh, there's clearly, and there's one at Heron Hall. So they're just all over the place, really. I mean, they're not out in the wild that much, but that, so I think George kind of dialed that back a little. And in or and that's I think it's also why he wrote the Raven Tree's tree is dead because if it was another living tree, then it's just making Catelyn more wrong <laughs> in yeah. respect. So he kind of had to play that off a little bit. So and a lot of those trees are in 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 around that area in the Riverlands near River Run as well. Yes, uh, that's very true. And finally, to make him a Targaryen bastard, he has to be his father has to have had an affair with a house. And it, you know, with someone, and it makes less sense for him to be sleeping with northern families because the northern families aren't down there that much. So it just makes a lot more sense that he would be. He he met Melissa Blackwood and slept with her kind of by chance. You know, he wasn't like out there pursuing her. He met her and was like, "Oh, look at her! I'm into her." And so for that to work with Aegon the Fourth being his character, it has to be a house that's kind of near, relatively nearby. You know, uh, kind of. So the Riverlands works really well for that because it's it's in it's near the God's Eye. It's relatively near King's Landing in terms of Westeros as a whole. So uh, yeah, I just think he didn't want him to be a Northerner because that's uh, for a lot of reasons and logistically it just wouldn't work for Egg on the Fourth that well. So uh, yeah, just to fit the to make the backstory work, <laughs> I think a lot of that has to line up properly. And because George filled out Blood Raven's character after a lot of the story had already been written, he was restricted in certain ways with what he could do because he he didn't do that if he had designed blood raven all the way through from the beginning might have looked a little different but he had to kind of you know gardener style he had to fit it in what he already had yeah i don't think i'd well i think i would agree with all of that in fact i, th I think that uh yeah he's the blackwoods it's not that they're an ama amazingly magic family that's suddenly going to come to the fore but clearly this the, the the worship of the old gods is an important part in uh in getting the the heritage mix right in certainly in blood raven's eyes for um uh the, the the prince that was promised i think that that is a key element here 
Uh, Samantha Rose, uh, in the books, has John walked into Ghost? Do you think Melisandre will bring him back, or do you think his body will be burnt like all the other Night Watchmen and somehow not burn, a bit like Danny? I think we picked up... Uh, thank you for that. I think we picked up on the 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 not burning bit earlier when we were talking about his hand. Targaryens do burn. This is how you you they traditionally burned dead Targaryens. So that was what what happens there. Um, my take is that what's going to happen in the books is that Jon's dead. He will warg into ghost. I think that that is. Uh, the way uh, we, we saw a hint of it, he calls out Ghost's name as he's dying. Um, so I think we've already seen a hint of that. I think that his body will be taken into, I think they're called the ice cells there in the at the wall um, while they're debating what to do with him. And I think that it probably will, yes, be Melisandre who brings him back a bit like that. But it's going to be different, subtly different from what happened with. Beric, for example, because John was actually in Ghost. So they're bringing back the body and then they have to call his spirit or soul or whatever it is that is there within Ghost and that has to be called back in some way. So there will be a couple of different bits to this. It's not going to be just a, an old-fashioned Lord of Light bringing people back to life moment. Um, do, do you have any other takes? I mean, I think that's pretty... A standard understanding of what's likely to happen. Have you got any tweaks on that from your perspective? Mm, I'll just throw in that the, this is backed up a little. This is backed up by Veramir's chapter, the whole concept of second life and all that. I think that was very much the point of that chapter. Um, I mean, it did other things. It's it's not the only point of that chapter, but a main point of that chapter is to to set up John's second life. And yes, you're, I, th I agree with you that he'll be in the ice cells. Uh, in part because of that quote from book one where Bran sees his body getting colder, all warmth fleeing from his body, that fits. I also think if we want to throw in a little something from Fire and Blood and the TV show, which is in the TV show we see sort of a, uh, a standoff between the members of the Night's Watch and the other members of the Night's Watch, the ones who were loyal to John and the ones who weren't, and they, were, and they were protecting his body. I think we'll see a more complicated version of this in the show. And we got a preview for it in Fire and Blood, I believe. With the end of Fire and Blood, you have what was called the Secret Siege. Uh, which is, you know, the Aegon the Third's counselors had him besieged in the Red Keep, and uh, it's um, very full of symbolism. And and since Aegon the Third is just overwhelmingly paralleled to Jon Snow, just over, just crazy how many parallels there are between Aegon the Third and Jon Snow. I see this as potentially an extension of that. Uh, John, while Jon is his body is lying there. They have this back and forth while they decide what to do. And uh, this is all potentially going to involve the news of, of Rob's will and or uh, other, you know, any other thing that might push the issue of his succession and his parentage. And uh, it's, so there's a lot of potential for just infighting at the wall and indecision and chaos. And I think uh, that lines up fairly well with what we see in the Secret Siege and Fire and Blood and with what we saw on TV. Uh, and I do agree that Melisandre will be, she's the only, you know, magic, really overwhelmingly magic person at the wall there. So it's hard to imagine somebody else, unless it's just nobody, unless John just drifts into, you know, he just, his powers just work that way. Uh, I guess that's possible. Yeah, I think it's possible. It's not, um, yeah, it's possible, no, but I, th I think it is likely to be Melisandre. Yeah. Um, uh, a final question from uh, my patrons, uh, Tiffany Ostergaard. Uh, pardon me, is uh, you had a long, long theory, which uh, I will have a look at properly on Patreon. Um, uh, but you're you're questioning the theory that the reason Rhaegar kidnapped Lyanna when he did is because they had a liaison at the tourney at Harrenhal and she became pregnant, which forced his hand and he had to go and get her and protect her and the unborn child. Um, uh, this fits in with the timeline, could mean Danny is his sister. Um, I think uh, f for me, no, so the, the tourney at Harren Hall happened obviously very early in this kind of uh, timeline that we're talking about, so that would um, that would make the wh whichever child was came from there would be significantly 
older than uh, the John that we have born at the Tower of Joy. Um, so uh, by perhaps a year or so, something along those lines, certainly not the kind of difference that you could take a baby up to Winterfell and claim that it was younger than Rob Stark, who, yeah. let's not forget, was conceived um, a long time later than that. So uh, that's, that's the thing in terms of the timing. If you forget everything else, the, the baby John was Ned claimed was younger than Rob and that had to be believable which means that he had to have been born you know, certainly within a few months uh, of him uh, let's say because otherwise you've got one child who's starting to walk and talk and, and the other one who's who's not and then people start going hang on a moment are you sure that one's younger <laughs> um, so so and and then we know also George R. R. Martin has told us that Danny is born eight or nine months after John, um, yeah. and we know when she was conceived as well. So, uh, so I, I like I like the theory and I like the thinking. Um, I think Rhaegar and Lena definitely met at the tower uh, to, at the tourney at Harren Hall, but I don't think that that was it follows there with the, the the pregnancy there because the timings don't seem to work in terms of the baby ages. Agreed. Um, Okay, guys, I'm going to start wrapping up. I want to just uh, quickly say a couple of things coming up on my channel, then throw over to Aziz for uh, just to uh, let us know what's going on in, in his world. In terms of what's happening here, obviously we've got the build-up to Season 8 of Game of Thrones. I've got my series. I would like to get it finished, the one that I'm, I'm working my way through on Robert's Rebellion. I think there are three, maybe four more videos in that, so if I can... If I can get them out at about one a week, then we should be able to do it before the series. Um, uh, that said, though, next week I'm going to take a week off. I'm just going to take some time to go on holiday, have a quick recharge of my batteries before the season. So there's not going to be a live stream next Thursday. Um, there will still be some videos coming out. Uh, I've, I've pre-recorded a few things that I can just edit and get out. So there will be still some things coming out, but the content might be a little bit lower over the course of the next week or so. Um, as usual, I want to thank my patrons. Um, I can't do this without you. I mean it. This is it's your support allows me to produce what I do uh, produce. Um, so thank you so much. If you are interested in supporting the channel, um, getting access to some exclusive stuff I do just for my patrons or getting a, a chance to get your uh, questions asked as a priority on the live streams. You've seen I frame my live streams around my patrons' questions. Do check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash IndieGeek. There is a link down in the description, so please do go and check that out. Um, Aziz, uh, what's going on with you? What, what should people be looking out for, and where can they find you on the internet? All right. Well, we can be found at historyofwesteros.com. We are Westeros History on YouTube and Westeros Hist or History of Westeros on iTunes and Acast and SoundCloud, Google Play. And all those names work for our social media as well. As far as what's coming up for us, we are doing uh, live streams on Fire and Blood every Tuesday. We're gonna, we've been doing that since uh, December and we're going to keep that going until just before the TV show starts. Then we'll switch to Monday and Wednesday coverage, which we've done every season since season four, which is we do show only discussion on Monday with our Unsullied co-host, Sean. And on Wednesday, we have uh, usually the guys from uh, the team from Radio Westeros, which we talk about the show in light of uh, what we know about the books. So uh, that's our recurring coverage as far as our scripted content, which is our, our bread and butter. We have Blood Raven 3 coming out. And that's uh, dealing with his life once getting to the wall and becoming the three-eyed crow and uh, vanishing beyond the wall and his time as Lord Commander and lots of stuff about that. We got a theory on cold hands in there. It's pretty cool. Lots of fun stuff. So that's uh, coming out really soon. We got a guest producer for that one. So I'm not actually sure what the date is going to be on the release, but very soon, within a few days. And then after that, we're um, going to do a scripted episode with... Uh, Radio Westeros, again, we're doing um, a full coverage of the Dance of the Dragons. It's going to take several episodes and uh, a full retelling and analysis with uh, both of our styles. They're going to be adding music and we're going to be doing all sorts of good quotes and everything. It should be a really nice production uh, if it comes out the way we hope. Um, I think that's it. We're always, we're this has been an extremely busy year 
Uh, so we're, we're over at history of Westeros. We're super busy putting out lots of content. So I may have forgotten something, but you at least know where to find us to check it out. Yeah. I, and, uh, thank you. Wayne, well, thank you for coming on. Um, uh, I only invite people on here if I personally recommend uh, what they do and, uh, history of Westeros, uh, Aziz, I share the stuff they do, not just now, but for the last few years has it's been at the heart of this community. So uh, thank you. Well, I, I mean, it's anyone who's been around here for a while will know that, that mm-hmm. particularly the knowledge you have is held in, in highest regard. So, uh, so guys, I would highly recommend you go over there and do check that out. It's available as, as a podcast um, uh, as well as uh, on YouTube as well. Um, Christy Miller, thank you so much for your super chat saying, keep up this channel. I have subscribed to Joe the Magician and Secrets of the Citadel because of you. Well, I'm, that makes me very happy. This is one of the reasons why I have people on here um, is because I'm I'm not the sole arbiter of knowledge or wisdom on A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones. Far from it. There are so many amazing people out here in the community. And if I can have people on here that uh, spark your imagination and interest uh, and get you to go over to their channels, then then that makes me really happy. So I'm so glad you found uh, Joe and Gemma. Uh, if you haven't checked out Aziz, please do go and do so as well. Um, and one other one from Donald Peoples. Uh, thank you so much. You're saying always a pleasure. Thank you. The pleasure was mine. Uh, guys, I have really enjoyed this. We went on for longer than I anticipated, uh, but uh, that's just because the questions have been so good. And and Aziz, uh, thank you for your contributions. Guys, thank you so much. Um, I won't be here next week, as I said, but I will be here the week afterwards as we build up towards season eight of Game of Thrones. Take care, everyone, and I shall see you again in a couple of weeks' time. Bye, all.